welcome to This Is Hardcore Podcast. You just heard MH Chaos, a band that will be featured more and more as their release gets closer to coming out. Vinyl will be on From Within Records. The big CD and the digital will be out on Fast Break Records. This is a band that absolutely blows me away every time I listen to them. They've got a bunch of new tracks coming out. I'm really fucking excited for them and just happy that we get to open the show with them. I got a lot of wild guests coming up in the next couple weeks, so before we got into a whole stretch of people, I wanted to dial back down to a friend of ours who would absolutely amazing episode, which was number seven, Godfather of PA Hardcore. Our guest tonight will be Richie Mancuso. Before we get into that, go to From Within Records and check out their number two zine featuring me, Bob Wilson, Jamie Morgan, Richie Crutch, and a few others. It's completely on PA Hardcore. Make sure to check it out. Go to at From Within on Instagram or From Within Records. Carter's a man, and he's got an amazing zine, website, decent jujitsu game. We love the guy. Big shout-outs to our friends in Please Die out of Philadelphia. Mike Hogan and the boys have an LP out on Lionheart Records, which is a European label. They are one of the most terrifyingly awesome Amazing hardcore bands from Philadelphia. Very fast, negative approach, agnostic front, old school, slap shot style. Obviously, these aren't small little kids, so the whole world doesn't go nuts with them, but that doesn't make them absolutely fantastic. You can check out a couple of their videos on Hate 5-6. They play to this hardcore. Go to Lionheart Records on Instagram or hit up Mike at MikeHooligan76 on Instagram to pick up an LP. Make sure you go to TIHCpodcast.com. Every single episode has its own page, links, and extra on there. You can support our guests that way. You can check out their own social medias. It's the easiest way to check out show notes. Is just go to TIHCpodcast.com. Thanks, everybody, who reached out about the Damien episode. It was one of my favorites. Sorry for being so long. Doesn't seem like that pushed too many people away from listening to it. It's great to hear people enjoy the punishment days. But more importantly, just to celebrate Damien, not only for... It was his birthday last week, but just the amazing person he was, how soft-spoken and humble he was for all the things that he's accomplished. I really appreciate you guys listening and giving me feedback. Anyone who gives me feedback on social media, I always interact. Thank you for doing so. Check us out. Follow. Subscribe. If you see me posting about a new episode, fucking repost. Help us out here. All right? Thank you. The show sponsor today is Crucified Straight Edge. You can go to the website, which is x crucifiedx.com. When Richie, Keith, and I were talking about doing something together, the idea of doing a straight-edge t-shirt company came to mind. Not because we wanted to make a bunch of bullshit pink tie-dye t-shirts that kids can wear at this hardcore, but we kind of wanted to go in the opposite direction where there was some cool straight-edge merch that wasn't really touched on and didn't make you look like a complete clown in public. You can go to Crucified Straight Edge on Instagram and on Twitter Check out our stuff, especially in the springtime. We're going to have a lot of things coming out, and we want to really thank everyone who has supported posts up on the internet. And if you've got any posts, tag us or reshare. You'll see a lot more Crucified Straight Edge in 2021. So check it out, Crucified Straight Edge. Go to xcrucifiedx.com and check the shit out. Before we start this episode, for those who haven't checked out Episode 7, Godfather of PA Hardcore. Go back and check that out. That was Richie's first appearance on the show. And there's a lot of his background and how we got to this position already in that episode. For those of you who are going forward and haven't heard episode 7, pretty quickly, Richie Mancuso, better known as Richie Crutch, is a stalwart legend in the Pennsylvania hardcore scene. He currently plays guitar in Wisdom and Chains. He is a huge part of the entire Pennsylvania hardcore scene. He's played in bands like Out to Win, Box Cutter, and he has a new project called Z9, which we talk about. He also is involved with Fast Break Records, and he is part of the Trinity Presents, which has brought some amazing shows to the Club Reverb venue in Reading, Pennsylvania, with myself and Chris Mahmood from Reverb Concerts. Richie was one of the first people that I spoke to about doing my own podcast, He runs an amazing podcast called Post America Podcast, which I've been a guest on several times. When I began doing this, he was a constant support 
and uh, frequently asked questions kind of guy who gave me a lot of motivation, put me onto some things, and is someone whose podcast has only gotten better over the last 100-something episodes. Specifically in the quarantine of COVID recently, he's done some amazing one-on-ones with some people within hardcore, a few actors and some famous people. It's pretty incredible. But as a whole, the Post America podcast is Richie Mancuso, Jotham Oliver, and Chris Mavaratis, all members of Wisdom and Chains. And it is a podcast that explores a lot of hardcore history while, you know, BSing, chatting up, a decent amount of politics, and just, you know, the everyday fare that comes from a podcast. And you can check it out on all the streaming sites. I had a general idea of the guests in the beginning of the episodes that I wanted to get. And I reached out to quite a few of them. There's still a few on the original email list where I was like, hey, I'd love to have you on the show that I haven't gotten to. But going in the direction that I went with the last 24 episodes and the constant amount of conversations that I've had with Richie, it was only a matter of time to bring him back on the show. This one, there is a good bit of back and forth conversation, debate, and we walk through a lot of things that just comes up in common conversation regarding hardcore music. I absolutely love talking to him, and this is a fun episode where I didn't have to stay too much on a linear path of interview and trying to dissect his history, and we just kind of traded things back and forth, not unlike the Scott Vogel episode where Scott and I kind of went over a lot of hardcore stuff as well. Hope you guys enjoy. Take care. All right, we're talking to Richie Crutch. Those of you who listened to episode seven, those of you who heard the majesty of the godfather of Pennsylvania hardcore, I got to tell you, it was one of the most well-received episodes of the first couple. And a lot of the young bucks around here were really happy to hear the history of PA and the surroundings that brought forth Crutch later strength for reason, the CC's culture, and just talking about the entire era. And it was brought to you by one Richie Mancuso, better known as Richie Crutch, guitar player of Wisdom and Chains, one part of the Trinity, and also a major force within Fast Break Records, and now involved in Z9, another band, and uh, has played in bands like Box Cutter, Out to Win, and runs right now the quarantine sessions version of the post america podcast where richie's group can't really link up because of covid and timing and such so richie's been doing these one-on-one interviews that have really been outstanding and i'm going on for almost a year now so richie you're back what's up what's up joe how's it going thanks for the intro and uh you know people like me and you this covid quarantine bullshit that doesn't stop us you know what i mean no, in fact, I love that you even managed to pivot over, you know, it, it, it becomes important when we are not able to engage not only the, the people that were, I would say that we're not just we're friends with, but the people that we're interested in doing music with and supporting. It's interesting to see those who can figure a way to factor in other alternate avenues to stay in touch. And I find that, especially with your podcast specifically, because in this whole entire hardcore podcast space, you've managed to get some of the biggest names in hardcore that tour depend upon touring. And we get a kind of under the hood look at the effect that COVID had on the industry end of the hardcore scene. And I, that's a completely unique thing within the hardcore podcast structure that I'm aware of. I've seen different episodes come out from different people and different casts. But I really like the take that you made where you were honestly engaging these folks whose living depends upon touring and how it was affected by COVID. Yeah, early on, we, we probably started this podcast in like 2015, I think. And early on, we would always have a guest. And then after a while, we kind of just went with it. There's already three of us. Fuck it. We don't need a guest. You know, if we get one, we get one. If not, all good. And then we just started for a long time the bulk of the podcast have just been the three of us talking about whatever stuff you know we, we are interested in when the quarantine and the covid and all that stuff hit and uh we couldn't get together i th- yeah, I was like yo this is uh 
a good time to get back to the interviews that we started at, you know, because that's that was our original thing. Early on, we would have Stigma on, Danny Schuler from Biohazard, uh, Bobby from Biohazard, dudes like that all the time. And then we we strayed from it. But now, like you said, it's important to hear from the full time bands like, you know, people are, are saying, oh, my job, I can't work my job. OK, we don't really think of the guys from, you know, band name, name them sick of it all as that's their job. But it is they're grown men and that's their job right now. So I thought it was like a an interesting look and just to bring some awareness that this thing we love, some people do it for a living. Not many, very few. So let's let's talk to them. Let's see how how to get on. You know, in that vein, before we delve into different par- uh, paths, one of the things that I admire the most about Wisdom and Chains is that you guys are working class guys. In fact, at one point, most of the band has had union concrete or construction jobs, and yet because of the quality of your songwriting your tenure in hardcore and your relationships, you've managed to tour with the cream of the crop as far as professional hardcore bands. And I wonder if you could kind of disseminate for us some of the things that you picked up being on the road, even if it's just weekends, like things and tips that you've learned watching the agnostic fronts of mad balls, the sick of it alls, all these bands that do this for a living and how the way that they operate is so vastly different from a band who just jumps up and plays shows from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. We've been lucky to do that because we're not, we're not the full-time band like those bands, you know, but we, we did, we do get a glimpse of what it takes to be one. And it's, it's not easy work. You know what I see when I see those, uh, when we do hit the road with bands like that, there's always a key guy. There's one person that takes a lot of responsibility, you know, and they, uh, the tour may not be as fun for that particular person because there's a lot of business involved, but they do what they have to do. So, I, you know, I always see that there's in every band you mentioned and all the other full time bands. There's one guy like, the you know, the work is split up in a way, but there's one guy that takes the bulk of the responsibility, the numbers, the routing, dealing with the, the promoter, dealing with their own booking agent, you know all the stuff and it's it you know i noticed that that responsibility it comes with a price because those guys aren't exactly having as much fun as the other ones you know what i'm saying to a degree and uh if you have someone in the band like that in your band willing to do that you're lucky because i've never seen a band function without that one key member not on that level not on like the full-time level you know and if you got more than one one person like that you're really set but it definitely takes like one key guy to just be willing to fucking all the off time, the time that they're not on the road, this person is working, you know, figuring shit out. And that's kind of what you need. That's, that's the biggest thing I saw when, when I hit, when I hit the road with bands like that. Now I noticed uh, from the back end of dealing with the bands, three fifths, four fifths of a band will show up and say, Hey man, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And that one guy will walk into the room with the stress under his eyes. Yeah. And you can see like, and, and a lot of times, as I said, Philadelphia is either routed in the beginning of a tour or at the end of the tour. And most recently, we've been getting a lot of the end of the road tours. And and I hear the, oh, I just can't wait for this to get over. You know, like there's a lot of that in the stress of what it comes to pull a tour together. Now, one of the things that needs to be said is that you had the opportunity to do possibly one of the best potential tours I've ever seen. In, and I actually could say in the world right before COVID hit in that persistence tour. And that lineup was beyond outstanding. And uh, what do you think you're, what did you think when they offered you that tour and you saw the lineup, which was like Gorilla Biscuits, Agnostic Front, who else was on the bill? Well, yeah, yeah. You had GB, you had AF. I like to say the letters makes me seem like cooler, more into it. And then you had Street Dogs, which was a cool addition, especially, for Europe because a lot of the street rock oi is really more intertwined with the hardcore band. So street dogs was on that. And it turns out that I think was their last thing that they did. I think they ended up calling it quits after that. Uh, then you had H2O on that. Um, you had Billy bio on that, which was kind of doing his solo thing, but it, of course it included like biohazard highlights, a lot of cover songs and just like a really fun set. Uh, you had, um, 
also from uh, the West Coast, you had Cutthroat and you had um, Count Time. So that for me, the, when I look at the when I look package. at that when I look at that package, I think about like I said to you in this is that there's a package where every single band is relating to the crowd, looking for sing-alongs, looking for everybody just to chant the words, and it's such a far difference, like a diametric opposite of how a lot of the tours are built in America as far as hardcore related. And I wonder, like, I mean, when you're on a tour like that, obviously I, well, we can get into the bus thing. How, how do you even get on stage when you're like, when you know coming up is this band and they just played, it, it, it's gotta be amazing to sit there as a fan, but then also as a band playing, like you have to be energized and excited for your set, seeing how things start popping off night after night. Right. Yeah, yeah, and and as like the fan, it was crazy because I I mean, I sat through so many bands every night and willingly wanted, eagerly excited, you know. And I, after a while, my my ear was they were just permanently ringing, you know, because I had the spot right in front of this amp, right behind this drummer every night. It was it was really cool, and it was almost like uh, I mean, it was really exciting to play, of course, but the excitement was to be the witness, you know, the witness to that, to the biggest, biggest sing-alongs from Gorilla Biscuits in front of the biggest crowds that I've seen them play and stuff like that. It, it was, yeah, it was real cool. We were real lucky to be part of it. And it was, you know, maybe in the U S people don't know, but that it's called the persistence tour. It's a yearly thing in Europe. And that was one of the coolest packages I remember seeing from, from that particular tour, man. It was a exciting tour. No, I find that the American audience has yet to really put the numbers in seats enough for us to build a hardcore tour at that level. There was an attempt by Tim Bohr and Paul Conroy with uh, 10 for 10 because the argument was to pay bands in America to do a tour like that, there would have to be like a low door price, like $10. So that way there wasn't like a giant political jockeying for I deserve more money, yada, yada, yada. And the 10 for 10, which was in 2010, so 11 years ago this year, was the only time in recent memory there was like a Goliath level tour like that. And I wonder if when it, when a band like Wisdom Machines is asked to be on it, I imagine you have to tell everybody in the band, like, we're doing this no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I passed the word, but of course, you know, we always have some resistance. Like, believe it or not, there was guys that weren't, you know, didn't think they could did do it or didn't want to do it. Like, <laughs> it's it's kind of ridiculous, but it's something that we just always deal with at some point. But uh, it was easy to talk them into. And you know what? It was the offer was was real legit. It was a fair offer for the place we played and the package itself was the selling point. And uh in the U.S., I just think that uh, maybe a tour like that would wouldn't go over because the scene is is really, uh, you know, it's divided up into mul you know multiple other scenes. Like there's the hardcore scene and the big circle, and then we start splitting the pie up, and then there's the kids in hardcore that like this music within hardcore specifically, and then that specifically. And in Europe, you could get a crowd of of people and, and you're going to see mohawks in the crowd and then you're going to see straight edge jackets in the crowd. You're going to see boots and braces in the crowd. You're going to see the the Carhartt hoodies. You, they're just more willing and, you know, they kind of know ahead of time this comes with the territory. There's all types of people here, all different kinds of scenes, people that love the scene. Over here, it's kind of like if you go to a show and there's nothing wrong with it, it's just mainly one type one group of of style you know of look and uh that kind of makes it hard to book book a band where a lot uh, a package where a lot of the bands deserve a decent amount of money you know because who's coming out what crowd is going to choose to attend this one it only works when people from a lot of different crowds choose to come out you know that's what makes it work in europe so i think that would have to be the winning scenario here is people just saying, yeah, I'm definitely fucking going, you know, not like I'm not going because that's this crowd, you know, and that's probably what would happen here if we're honest. I feel like, and you and I through the Trinity with our Keystone jams and stuff like that, we've managed to pull together like good one day shows. that are not too far away from the kind of lineup that you'd see on a tour like that. And yeah, you're totally right. We'd have to, 
depend upon, oh, make sure we get some heavier bands so the young guys play, make sure you get some young bands, make sure you get some old names that haven't been around. Like there's a a weird recipe to cook for a big crowd. And that's why I feel like when you're doing a show like that. And I've always, I've always wondered what someone like you who have, I mean, you came as we talked on the last episode, you were going to Europe at a really young time as far as like for bands from this area goes. And I wonder what your perspective is on why European hardcore, the bands from America are able to tour like that. And if there's anything that we could ever do to make that more possible in America. Yeah, I don't, in America. Well, I think there's uh in Europe, let, let's say, you know, these bands that toured real early really made their mark and they were put on, on these, these insanely big festivals with bands like Slayer bands, like Dropkick Murphy's, even bands like Twisted Sister and Guns N' Roses. And they were put in a place where they, okay, just by their lineup position, okay, this band is a well-known, respected band. So even if you didn't know them, you'd assume, huh, oh, the band ball's playing up here, like, you know, right before Sepultura on, on the main stage of this. of the, So the people just said, Mad Ball's a heavy band that we like. So now people that just like heavy music, they like Mad Ball. Not to mention the sure thing crowd that is going to love Madball, the hardcore crowd. You know what I'm saying? So now you have that potential. In America, you never really had that that like backing of these bands, like to 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 jockey, like put in that position. For the most part, we did have you know you have a band that breaks through here and there, but for the most part, they never you know you don't get these like same festivals go on here. They just for the most part don't have the hardcore names on them until recent times. I've been seeing that you know. So I think without that you're not going to be able to have a package similar to the one I just said that's going to be good. Yeah, and PA, it'll be good because I think PA has a really open-minded, like, inviting kind of vibe to the shows and the scene. But, like, let's say when that same package hits, uh, you know, you name the city, it's probably not going to go over that well, you know. And uh, so to do the one, one-off one like we do, me, you, and Chris, or, or, or you do with, like, uh, this is hardcore, that's a different story. That's in PA. That's on solid ground, on, on reliable ground. Outside of here, there's only a couple of spots where those shows are going to work. You know, I, I don't know what it'll take, to be honest. At this point, you have like, uh, you know, some some bands like Knock Loose, Code Orange, that get a lot of attention and a lot of uh, a lot of help. And you're seeing them on, on advertisements. And, and that's great. I just don't know if that means that they're looking for the other bands behind them. Who else? Who else can we pull into this? Not the bands themselves, but the the people that function to put them in the, in that position. You know, I, you, we we know Code Orange is going to help out whoever they could help, but I just mean the companies themselves. Like there was never any real financial backing for any of these bands in America, whereas in Europe, I I, me- I remember being in Japan with with Crutch, and I walked into a Gap store that sells clothes, and they were playing Mush Mouth on, on the uh, on the uh, speakers in the store. That's fine. Like, you, you, you would just never, it would never, yeah, that would never be a thing here. And I remember going to, we did, we played in Wisdom and Change, just did a, a, a show in Columbia of tens of thousands of people. And beforehand, they had us on the local TV station giving interviews and talking to people. And it just, that stuff is just not an, you know, the American way for the hardcore scene. It's, it's, it's a great scene here, but it's really, disrespected in the big picture overall music picture in america i think no i actually i actually agree with you in 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 almost all those tenets i feel as if there's a moment in hardcore band and you saw it specifically as an active band member seeing bands like we talked about in your episode that were getting really really to the point in fact sometimes bigger than what our what our metric for what big hardcore band is now Mm-hmm. And where the most quotable quote we have on this podcast is actually from you, which is? is high, which is high tide raise all ships. I feel like when a hardcore band is changing towards a crowd so they continue to grow, they're not thinking about anybody else. They're like, all we have to do is tweak these three things. And we're going to be the next, and you just put a blank under whatever you want to, whatever you want to call the next, whatever that is. And the closest we came 
to kind of seeing an elevation of hardcore as far as like more of a commercial potential market was in credit to Jamie Josta. And it started with him having his stillborn fests every December. And obviously, Hatebreed at the time had grown from a band small as everybody else to, you know, they were selling out 2,000 person rooms for a couple of days straight. And you'd see some bigger bands on there, man. I mean, and you'd see the biohazards and the, the sworn enemies and these man balls. You know, there's quite a few still wore scarheads. There's quite a few hardcore bands that were, he was trying to raise them up. You know, he did that with um, Full Bone Chaos. He did it with Sworn Enemy. Yeah. And I he feel did that like, with Strength for a reason. He, he helped those guys out a lot. Oh, yeah, that's right. There was that Stillborn Fest up in mm-hmm. PA. He put, yeah. And that's the thing is, and he's done, I'm actually, I mean, an interesting thing is that Blacklisted had a record out on the on the label Walk All Night that the guy Bob Mack, who booked at a home base in Wilkes Bar had. Yeah. And Bob Mack the way I believe it went was Bob put the record out, Jamie via J reason. They bought the rights to that and they bought out blacklisted to be on stillborn blacklisted as an earlier band opened up or played second in one of those stillborn fests and later death wish took blacklist away. But even, even he even had his pulse on blacklisted. And I find that. Yeah. I find that. There's been few times since, and that we're talking about 20 years ago, almost now in some cases, where we've really seen the ability of a hardcore band to really elevate the position and presence of other bands. And uh, taking this all the way back to what we we're talking about with the podcasts in general, I feel like there's a chance with podcasting as being a platform in itself to level the playing field in a way that so. The word, I don't know, are you familiar with gatekeeping, what that word yes. is? Yeah. So it, it, in 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 a lot of ways, it's impossible. My perspective and belief is that you can't gatekeep something that if you have access to a device that everybody in the world basically has access to, and you could type in the word hardcore punk, things are going to come up. You find a band name, things are going to come up. So I feel like it's an it's a stupid argument and it, and it has no it has no tenable importance in the in the bigger conversation to argue about gatekeeping when all of this is more accessible than it's ever been in the 40 years of hardcore punk's history and it's a, like a nuanced stupid kind of like little kid discussion like oh well you're gatekeeping or you're keeping people from it's like I I can't keep you from the internet you have the no, internet it's impossible you could use the term but you can't enforce that term you know well, it's like a, it's a, so I, I believe it's used as like an attack. Yeah. It's not meant in the real sense. It's meant like you're doing something I disagree with. So I'm going to label it as this. But my, my thing is, so there isn't the giant commercial success for hardcore as a whole in the records. The, the audience is smaller. The major labels aren't interested in part for almost all of us besides a very small few. The distribution isn't there. And so I had a thought a couple of days ago, just seeing the way that the circle of podcasts growing is obviously encompassing things like Damien's, you know, um, grew up a punk and all these things. It's evident, especially with social media, that you'll see celebrities on Twitter with different T-shirts. In fact, the most you'll see like the Ben Affleck with the Bridge Nine stuff. There was talk of... um, I fucking forget that guy's name. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me after the fact, but he's got like old school, legit hardcore, uh, hardcore fucking things. And you see these people that are obviously from our culture. I wonder if it's just time. And I wonder if we need that level playing field that really knocks down whatever gate is left. You know, like in, in one hand, we could argue, well, look at fucking fear being on Saturday Night Live in the early 80s. And you look at these moments where hardcore came so close to doing something in a yeah. bigger commercial setting and just didn't. And I wonder what your thoughts on is in everything that I just said, like just the, the potential reasons why it never broke into something bigger. That's and, that's uh, tough. Like, like, think about it. You have you have a band like uh, Slipknot that's, you know, does crazy numbers, really big. 
then you'll have like this, like, you know, name little whoever from the new rap scene. They, they shoot each other and uh, they're fucking crazy. They can't really even rap, but somehow they're getting tens of millions of streams and big money. And they potentially never even played a live show in a lot of cases. And you can't get a hardcore band, you know, on an average to, to draw, you know, the bulk 99% of them couldn't draw 250 people on a, every night of the week on a tour. You know why? I have no fucking clue. I know that when there was big money in the music industry, there, you know, that, you know, they, uh, they never cherry picked any, any hardcore bands for like a real investment. You have a couple bands that hit a major label. It wasn't crazy, insane, uh, contracts, but they did get some major label deals. But, uh, the reason fear was on Saturday night live was because of a particular person, you know, the reason, uh, any of those other bands you mentioned was because of Jamie Josta. Like it's because of hustlers and people that really love it. And in their minds, why doesn't everybody love it? Like this should be the, it, it, if I could just show the world, this everyone will love it. Well, every time the world was shown a hardcore band, it didn't really go like that. So maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's just like a thing that for a few people and there's a, a genetic, like a, formation of our, of our earlobes and with the way the tubes in our heads are laid out and it, it only it only really sticks to a few people and that's fine with me too i would love for there to be proof about that then we could really feel special but uh i don't know if that's the case but there's no real good explanation you know that i could see because in my mind there's so much garbage out there that raises straight to the top like there's so much crappy metal. I have Sirius XM in my car, and all this sing-song, you know, melodic singing, like flat to back to like a scream back and forth. You know, ten thousand bands like that are getting play, and you couldn't fucking beg somebody to to fucking to fucking do something with a band like All Out War, Death Threat. You know, that's just for the scene only. I don't know what it is, man. I don't I don't know if there is a reason. We have the podcast. We'll talk about it all day. We'll talk about the bands we love and nobody could stop us. We're not really interested. If somebody from fucking uh I don't know, uh Rhymestein or Ramstein or whatever called me up and wanted an interview, I'd I'd pass because I have no interest. But meanwhile, that's what people are listening to. That's what get gets millions of streams. But if somebody from fucking Powerhouse hits me up guess what? I'm going to talk to him for two or three hours and be happy about it. It's just, uh, it's a weird dynamic, man. I don't know if there's any explanation that I could accept to why hardcore hasn't hit the masses in a way, like almost every other genre of metal to hip hop to, to whatever, you know, it's, it's a mystery to me. Well, it's interesting. Think about in the times in pop culture, so at the earliest level, Saturday Night Live. Later, Beastie Boys would come to rise from the Lower East Side. And, you know, those guys were legit. You know, whatever you want to say, they're legit. Totally. New York hardcore originals. And they rose to the point of taking Murphy's Law on a tour. And uh, something I'm going to get into in a different episode and, and, and something I'm delving into in a completely separate stream of conscious kind of podcasting is just looking into these things and trying to understand, like, there was a moment via profile records and such where so many bands that were getting records to come out on this were, were fucking well known. Like profile would put those records on the same level that we're talking about in yeah. the store alongside. And they're you know, like Murphy's law. They did a fucking full stadium tour with beastie boys, you know, uh, the, the access and exposure, which is something that I was taught on an episode later on that I had with my buddy, Ernie Talbert on this one. And, and there was two words constantly now coming to these conversations. Cause they're like the perfect setting for it. But like hardcore had its access and the mass was exposed, but it just wasn't tenable as far as a commercial enterprise. And yet so many facets of our culture are major marketing dollars. You know um, the chicken and egg argument could be had about skateboarding. Obviously, skateboarding came like literally before hardcore punk came into play, but it's one of the great beginning. Like, it's such an immediate conduit to show people hardcore from as the late 70s. You'll hear people talking about 
being skaters and finding hardcore into today's world where hardcore kids are because of COVID getting back into skating. And I'm like, I always made a joke. Like you're going to see all these 26 year old skaters be like, I just found out about hardcore because all these skaters showed up. All these hardcore kids showed up to skate, yeah. which is like the opposite. We're like people in our teens, people in the teens were finding hardcore through skating. I think it's going to reverse. And I, I mean, we can go through it, you know, um, punk rock and thrash is the same level of all the stuff that we're talking about. And yet they managed to find a higher commercial value than punk and hardcore. And I mean, there's actually a really depressing part of hardcore in the turning point of the eighties. And I I'm, I'm, I'm going to have Paris on the show soon where I'm going to ask him what he thinks about it. But it's like a bunch of these guys who were in the first generation of hardcore bands, they started trying to go more metal. Like in bizarre bands, like even like gangrene, etc., we're going oh, for yeah, a more definitely. met, and it's so it's like hardcore at different times. As I said earlier, they shed a couple, like oh, you know, maybe we'll change this about us and we'll get a little bit bigger, and that little bit bigger never happens. And I'm just always curious when, like, when I'm talking to someone like you, you're a student of the game, you're a true purveyor of the subculture. You've toured the world more than so many people, and you've been in small rooms talking about hardcore culture with some of our greatest, you know, champions. I wonder if you've ever picked up anything, or you had heard something about why you, th- you know, what other people may have thought. But in general, it's something that's constantly uh, coming up in conversations. Is like why hardcore has, because it's not saying, oh, you know, hardcore's never really tried to get big. It's like. No, there's like extant proof that every culture has bands that get bigger and bands that change to get bigger. Yeah. No, there's examples of of bands that had the shot. And uh, the only one I could say that was successful was probably Hatebreed, you know, with, with the shot. There was, I remember when VOD got picked up from... Uh, you know, went on to uh, the sub label of Roadrunner, which yeah, was, it was like still- T. T. I forget it was like a, it was a, yeah it was a sub it was a sub sub one right it was like so a soul something maybe it was for, I think the guy from Youth of Today was involved with that label somehow or something. Uh, but yeah, it was a sub label of Roadrunner, which is it's it's basically about as a major label as an independent label could be. But you know what? I think with with uh, I thought VOD was going to take over the world, but then when that record came out, it didn't seem like the VOD I remembered. You know. And in my head, this is no diss to VOD, but I thought, damn, if they only showed everybody what we saw on our end, and I think whoever signed them and brought them onto this label, I think things would have been different, even though they went on to do, you know, big things. But uh, I think a couple of times, hardcore bands, the Cro-Mags, the Cro-Mags got really weird. You know what I mean? They got like when they started getting some commercial interests and uh touring with some bigger bands they really changed their their sound and their style you mentioned gangrene uh we could go on and on where where bands that did get the shot for some reason thought it would take like okay we got the shot because of who we are but now we have to change and we're gonna sound different and you know if it's like not an organic natural change but it's a change to you know because you think you you need to do it to please the masses it's probably not going to work you know and i think that a couple of hardcore bands went that route and uh a couple bands just didn't get enough of a push you know like let's say sick of it all they went to a major label and they didn't sonically change too much it was actually they sounded a little heavier than they normally did and uh but it was a bad time it was a time when all the other major labels were picking up like grunge bands, you know, and then these guys picked up sick of it all and you're going to get overlooked. You know, some things are just easier to listen to. You could, you, you could put Nirvana on the radio and then you could pretend that you're listening to a really unpolished raw band. Meanwhile, they had a million dollar studio production, but putting a sick of it all on the radio from, from that era, that's a little too harsh to people, you know? And, uh, it's to me, it's hard to explain. I could only guess, and my answer would probably be different from day to day. But I'd like to think that it's just an exclusive music that only a f- certain people get. That's what I like to think. 
because then that will make me feel better, not like a fucking loser. You know what I mean? <laughs> because I've been playing this music for so long. What? What? Nobody fucking likes this shit. It's just the same old people. But you know, the same old people to me are like that's they're the uh, that's that's the special group of people. You know, so that's what I like to think. It, I don't, you know, because we could we could find an example like if only this, and we could say, well, look, Band X had that and it didn't work. Well, if only that. Oh, look, like I said, the only example I could think of that was successful is hate breed. But unfortunately I think they lost a lot of their hardcore following, even though I guess you could argue they didn't really change that much, but it was just different enough or the hardcore crowd is just particular enough that they didn't kind of bring the hardcore crowd with them when they, when they made that move, you know, um, I wanted to get into this with you real quick. Cause it's a, uh, it was a uh, need to be said. So, Super Soul was something that Ray Kappa was involved with. That's it. With, and then what happened is, is they were picked up direct to Roadrunner for a record. And what I was talking about was TBT was the, like the big moment for them. They got like, I believe actually I, my, my recollection is minimal, but I believe TBT had a big hand in a nine inch nails record. So like, it was like elevated mm. to that point. And I, it, it's uh, for people who are our age, and you're a little older, but we were in the same like cultural time. MTV came out with MTV two, and they would have like skateboarding and and snowboarding videos. Doggy Dog was a regular play. When Sib came out on um, the label that they were on, which was like Atlantic Records, you know, and, and the Sib Set Your Goals record is probably one of the best examples of when a band starts off with a fucking insane lineup and puts out an amazing record like that. I, I, it's still one of my favorite hardcore records just for time and place. And um, that was because Mike Gitter, who's like the head of A&R at Century Media at the time, got that on Atlantic. They were on MTV the whole summer of the first Warp Tour, along with Sick of It All. And something that you touched on was that grunge was hand in hand. If you look at the first Sick of It All, uh, you looked at the first Warp Tour lineup, Quicksand and Sick of It All were over L7. They were over Sublime. You wow. know, they were over Pennywise. Like, I, I tell people this who are like, who are younger and didn't probably see the Warp Tour till the early 2000s or mid 2000s when it was already kind of like what pe- modern idea of Warp Tour is. It's like, that was a fucking punk, dangerous ass show. Everybody wore combat boots, mohawks. I felt I, like, because I was young as shit, I was 15 years old. It was like a grown group of fucking punk skinheads, hardcore people like you're talking about. In relation to that persistence tour, that was the first warp tour. Yeah. And 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 there were, yeah, there was L7. Actually, um, Chaka's band Orange Nine Millimeter opened up the one stage. But at that time in 1995, uh, it was a couple years past the grunge and alternative scene had started making some big commercial in, in inroads with uh stuff like Green Day, stuff like Rancid. So hardcore was seen as like that second wave of like, well, if these if all this is gonna break. Then of course these bands will also break, and something happened, and it just didn't fucking go. <laughs> it's fucking crazy, right? And it's like you got there's so many relatable bands, and like you know, be it the post hardcore era of like the early '90s. I mean, Quicksand was on that one. T- I mean, the guy Matt Penfield, like you said, guys have a particular like reason. Matt Penfield and um, the name slips, but uh, is a, another person who was really involved in MTV One Twenty Minutes. And getting hardcore punk and metal onto these TV shows, they were trying their balls off to help us out. Handsome, like uh, Deftones, Deftones, Corn were doing tours alongside Sick of It All, alongside um, quite a few bands. You know, Orange Nine Millimeter, Sick of It All, Corn was a tour. Deftones uh, opened for Quicksand and Sib. Quicksand would break up. And Sib would headline the remaining tour, and Deftones would play that tour. And you know, Sergio uh, would eventually join Quick uh, Deftones or whatever. You know, like yeah. It, um, it's so a what's very, the reason? They just don't I, like it, it. It's it's like the 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 X factor, the missing uh, genome to make everything perfect in the world. Is that at a commercial level, and I think it's an American commercial level, hardcore punk is just missing one fucking thing. But if you look at 
pop culture and in and, and the urban outfitters world of the last 10 years, all these little younger folks, they get these graphic design jobs, they work for these little corporate entities. And they throw in little things like the minor threat sheep on something, the bad brains, DC bull, you know, like they co op the imagery, uh, they co op the imagery. And, and it's accessible. And I mean, to the point now, and what I'm going to get to is like, so thrash metal w- was started at the same time frame as hardcore punk, as far as time goes. And for whatever purpose or reason, you know, Kill 'em All came out and really changed a lot for music. And then metal through Metallica doing support, et cetera, et cetera, would grow. Thrash metal would grow. And kind of at that time, I don't, there was obviously thrashers and tape trading and a whole underground thing that we had. But commercial success became possible by the end of the 80s for thrash metal bands that grew at the same time and rate as hardcore bands in the 80s. In the 90s, the bands that grew at the same time our Bad Brains and our Chromags and our Leeways were growing were on MTV and were mi- and selling all- millions of records or half a million records to our 50,000 and 150,000. And that's the fucked up part of this. It's like, where so, <laughs> and I, like, I, 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 I'll get into it with you. And I've not, I've spoke about having another podcast, but it really what I'm doing is interviews. Um, partially in regards to the OG Gavin broadsheet breakdown and actually Vinny Paz and Gavin talked about it on their show. And they said that we were talking about it off the air. It's like the, what was first, like the chicken and the egg argument. What was the reason how this all exploded? And then like, as I talked to you about this, like when we talk about the commercial entity of hardcore and why it stops in America, there's all these elements where it's like, well, if this works, why doesn't this work? If this happens. Why doesn't this happen? And it's a fucking anomaly, man. Like there's only room on the on the on the podium for three. You have the first place, second place, third place. Yeah. And obviously, um, big shout outs to Code, big shout outs to Turnstile. And, and you know, these are the bands at any given time knock loose are like the three on the podium. And any and and depending on your pejorative, how you feel about their music, put them in any order you like. But those are really the three commercially biggest acts in hardcore right now. All of them have less than 20 years in. And it's our older bands that are revered, but kind of less out of the commercial um, successes like that. And my thought is to you, it's kind of like more like a bet or hedge your bets. Looking at the timeline of all the different errors that you've been involved in hardcore, would you say that? We will have more bands in the future in a higher commercial value, or do you really, or do you think we're going to stay in this same formula where it's only a couple bands representative of the entire genre that are able to touch commercial success at any given time, and the rest are going to stay within an underground? I say there'd be only a few, and uh, those few will be, they'll be, you know, culturally hardcore, but sonically hardcore the hardcore sound is so broad you know you you mentioned turnstile to code orange like is that like the same thing at all but it is somehow but it, to a person who doesn't know the scene at all who's totally unfamiliar with hardcore and you played one band and the other band he would tell you they're two different things you know uh so there's gonna always be bands that break out or certain people who have the pot, you know, the potential to, to make them bigger, find interesting. But for the most part, the bands that sound like hardcore as we know, uh, they'll, you know, there's never going to be that sort of success for them. You know, they'll be able to survive and, and make a living and, you know, and do good in life. Of course, if they wanted to, you know, pursue this music a- as a career, because really, if you just, if you, if you, if you're pretty good, you write good songs and you play and you're smart, You'll, you, you'll do it. But to be on that next level, I have no idea what it takes, 
you know, definitely hard work. You got to you be willing to play all the time and this and that. Even though in other genres of music, you don't have to even be willing to play live or tour. You just have to exist and put a video on YouTube. And the next thing you know is, you know, it's it's just a weird thing. Like, I, I don't, I don't, it's a mystery to me because to me it is the greatest the greatest scene, you know, and uh, I've been involved with other scenes. I, I went to rap shows. I went to metal shows. I went to all of that stuff. I was involved with that stuff, but it's, it's, and maybe it's our attitude to me. All the other shit is just corny, you know, and it could be the choices made by the people in the bands and maybe they're not as approachable. Maybe they're a little too uh, arrogant. I don't, I don't know, but dude, you, you just, to me, it's a mystery. I don't know. Well, like if you bring up hip, hip hop, yeah, the that's another that's another tenable argument for why hardcore should have had its hand in yeah. the commercial success in pop because there's so many elements in New York hardcore, specifically New York City hardcore, that are relative and have a relationship to hip hop because they were there in the 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 formative 80s when hardcore and hip hop shared the same venues, the same proximity, the same neighborhoods, the same friendship groups, the same tactics to exactly. sell the, the, the flyers and the tapes and, and, and just hustling I mean, and music to stores the point, to the point where like mob deep, they even actually accidentally stole the sick of it all dragon in the mid nineties. Yeah. They saw it all over New York. It's like, Oh, I'm going to take that. And they're like, Hey, uh, that's someone's. And they're like, Oh shit. My bit. Well, yo, can we be cool? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, and obviously KRS one was sampled, you know, like there was a reverence at the earliest stages in hardcore for hip hop because it was seen as organically natural forming. And for me as a student and trying to understand the culture, not only of hardcore and punk, but the, I don't look and I, and I guess I should address this from the outset, but I had not, I'm not looking to make sure that hardcore bands sell 2 million units and it turns into some like weird thing. It's more of a student of like just reading zines forever. And now in the podcasting world, listen to so many conversations where it's not. And then this is when we got signed and my entire life changed and things are better. Hardcore bands exist. So few in commercial land of full success. It's like a rise and a fall and and there's a beauty to it. And then there's a sense of sadness to it. And there's a fragility in the lifespan of a hardcore band because things that I set up earlier in a podcast, when we talk about, you know, working hard, like most bands in hardcore do not become a tenable lifestyle that gives a band a, li- a living for the rest of their natural life. But if there, um, there's this dopey band that has like that Superman song. Lately, I've been pissed the fuck off because I'm on the concrete with these plumbers and they listen to the radio all the time. And I'm like, how is this jerk off song on the radio? And these guys probably all sit home and don't have jobs because they wrote one fucking song that still played like, I don't even know when that fucking song came out 20 years ago, 25 years ago. (laughs) Like there's entire bands in relation to another thing we could talk about. If you want to get bored, uh, like that trapped band. They write one song, which I didn't even know that was their song. I don't, I'm not really familiar. I, I, I'm the least pop music person, you and you know this. Yeah, I don't, I don't turn really, the radio on. I don't even know I, what the you fuck know, I know, I know a shit ton about classic rock, early 80s heavy metal. I know nothing about pop music. And, and in fact, like when grunge came out, I was one of the most angry humans about it because I was into thrash and death metal. And I had to lie to a girl because she asked me if I liked Pearl Jam. And it was the first time a girl had ever really like talked to me besides like hand me a pencil. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course I like Pearl Jam. I had to ask Jim Layfield, who passed away a couple of years ago. I'm like, yo, can you play me Pearl Jam? Like, what the fuck? And like, I had to like find out what it is because it's the first time girls were talking to me. I'm like, fuck, I got so I, like I'm a bitch and had a fucking fake liking Pearl Jam for this girl. <laughs> Remember how big they were, Pearl Jam? Wow. Well, that's a gift. Well, see, you got to understand this. Like, from, from my timeline, you know, I posted pictures. I'm wearing Metallica Slayer, Testament, Obituary, Cannibal Corpse shirt. I'm getting kicked out of classes. I had overkill. We don't care what you say with the middle finger shirt. And my mom's like, don't put duct tape on it. But then I was getting kicked out of class. She's like, all right, you can put duct tape on it. So I don't get kicked out of school <laughs> for wearing it. 
And I got long hair. I got fucking braces. I look like shit. And some girl's like, hey, do you like Pearl Jam? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I do. Here's a girl talking to me. Yeah. And I never kissed a girl in my life. Of course, I'm going to fucking lie. But I've always had a hatred of that. And I remember when Nirvana had come out, was the plateau, not plateau, um, the threshold time where I was aware of what hardcore was. But, I, you know, it's like I went to a couple shows that wasn't full in, you know, still a fucking headbanger. But I was like, you know, I seen Sick Little Show already. I remember being down South Street and one of the guys from Inga Dagger was selling Nirvana tickets. And I thought he was like selling fake tickets and he turned out to be fake, but everybody who bought them from him got in. Mm. So we went and seen them and I didn't understand because it wasn't death metal. It wasn't sick of it on biohazard, which is a show I had seen like, you know, and it wasn't mad ball, but it was like, all right, I get this, but it was like, Rock music for young, boring white kids that are just like the kids from my neighborhood. You know, like it wasn't aggressive, it wasn't scary, it was dopey. Yeah, it was and safe. It was safe enough yeah. with like a little costume on it, you know. Now I go on to see uh Lala Palooza and and because um I had older friends like Jim Layfield and a lot of the Frankfurt gang were a little bit older, they were and they weren't they they stayed full metal, they never went all hardcore. Um they were into a lot of that stuff. So we went to the Lollapalooza and checked that out. And I was into stuff like Nine Inch Nails. I was into stuff like Ministry. I was really into Sepultura, Pantera, all that shit in the early 90s. I was fucking like way into. But once I started going to them like hardcore shows, like you said, I'm just fucking edgier. And, and everything and, and else seemed goofy. It, it's just like, well, you know, it's like I can love a heavy metal. I can love Guar for the theatrics. But there's something real about hardcore punk that's just not somewhere else, man. And I, and it's hard to say. And like in thinking about it, um, two summers ago we had the last as hardcore, and I had not the last ever, but the last one that took place. Mm -hmm. Um, we had Keith Morris doing off. This is a guy who, by rock standards, is the equivalent to like an Iggy Pop in relation to the culture and like a like a defining figure. And he was a normal ass motherfucker. And he was yeah. so happy. And now that we're a year away, a year away from it, they because we did off, he was excited. And we were trying to get Circle Jerks to do the first East Coast show back at this hardcore. And wow. he was psyched for it. And to me, I'd seen Circle Jerks at the TLA at the end of the 90s. And that was one of the craziest fucking shows. The same thing for Fear at, at the TLA. It wasn't as packed. But, dude, there was a – I'm not exaggerating this number. And, you know, there's people that can back this up. There was well over a hundred Nazis at that show. Damn. And there was I ton, believe it. And there was a shit ton of skinheads, like regular ass R type skinheads. And it was a fucking it wasn't one of them shows where it was a total brawl and the show got shut down because everybody wanted to see fear. It was one of them tit for tat. They hit us, we hit them, and it didn't turn into a giant fucking brawl because everybody was so psyched for fear. And I think about that now, like, I don't think there is 15 and 16 year old hardcore kids in this day and age who would be psyched for the sound of a fear. So I, 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 I talk circular for a purpose with this one. I feel like in 40 years of hardcore, the direction sonically has changed often. And the most popular aspects of hardcore have changed. So what going on what you said, how, Code and Turnstile and Knock Loose all sonically aren't representative of like the classic parameters what a hardcore band sounds like. That's what it would take to be commercially successful. And that's why most hardcore bands strike out because you're never, I mean, like there's a cultural like reverence for minor threat. And like you could see, like they had this little kids, these little uh, Japanese kids, I believe. Uh, if I'm not wrong, there was a video of them singing um, just a minor threat. I saw that. And it had like 3 million views. And so many people, because of time, r relate back to minor threat. Obviously, Ian and the DIY culture around his record label is iconic. And the uh, evolution of indie rock is important. And, and he's tied into that. So that could be a branch of why so many people know that song. But, you know... Um, Vice, vice and noisy writers jump over fucking heaps to try to find more bands around the time of Bad Brains 
to push this narrative that these small bands that were um that were left out for different reasons you know it's like no man like this is a small culture from the outset there's a small group of humans and that's where i'm getting at with this other thing i'm doing with this podcast where we're gonna we're interviewing first generation people like the people that were in proto punk bands the bands like when i had that conversation with you and you said i listened to black sabbath and that's what got me turned on towards listening to hardcore hardcore was out for years before you came into the game the people i'm speaking with they're in the fucking game before the game started. They and, invented the game. Well, they weren't inventors. Sometimes they were curators, supporters, and other times they were fans. And what that tells me is like, your Black Sabbath was the fucking bands that the guys who started writing the first hardcore risk were in, still influenced by. I always said Black Sabbath uh, Paranoid is the first hardcore song. Black Sabbath Paranoid, Alice Cooper, and to some degree, depending on the variance of people you talk to, you would think that Iggy and the Stooges would have like a bigger iconic cultural, but they didn't because yeah. so many people were checking them out when they were in like that weird drugged out 40 minute jam band stage. Like it was later on that the people from hardcore would respect and resonate with some of the stuff because by the time they were finding out about Iggy, it wasn't a picture, but Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath were huge figures in, in turning people into hardcore punk in the late seventies and early eighties. So it's like, we have the same fucking fathers, but we end up being the ugly stepchild of the metal punk fucking world. Ah, crazy ah, that is funny though. It really is. Like if you talk to someone, Rodney Dangerfields of, of music, yeah, we get no fucking respect, but yet, fuckers. but yet because we didn't do what you said, which is like act like rock stars because our culture is built hand in hand DIY. We're still making flyers. And, and, and what really resonates with me is it's really hard. It was really hard in the nineties to produce a, a zine. I've been, I wrote for zines, but I never was able to produce a full ass zoom zine. Be, a, one of the fallbacks of ADHD is starting projects and not finishing them. And I have half a million zines half started interviews. That I did. I still have some of them. I always feel like I'm going to, I might just read them on the podcast because it's easier to do a podcast than any other time it was to make a zine. And so I feel like the podcast of today are yesterday's zines in, in, in current form. And that's the best chance we may ha now have to see bands and our culture get a kind of even platform to rise commercially, because if we're depending upon a sound to get picked up, it's not going to happen. And, and, and going back to the hip hop thing, you said we're like the little, little rappers. The little rappers don't sound like mob deep. They don't have a respect for boom bap. Nah. So it's like they probably don't even know those fucking names. So you can't expect the modern cultures to the modern people who will buy the records that'll make a band a millionaire or a commercial success. They're not looking for the purest form of hardcore. Like, I imagine if you would, if a band would come out now being like Victim in Pain and there was never a Victim in Pain, it would sound sonically interesting for people that are people who are fans of old punk and that style, but it could never be written to commercial success. You never. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, thank God, Minor Threat, when they put it away, they put it away. And it's something that you had said on the Smoking Word podcast with Hoya that I found to be accurate interesting and completely true we have a reverence for the forefathers of hardcore because of their time in and what they did at the earliest phase and it's like the, the saying is often you know like we're standing on the backs of giants or the shoulders of giants but a lot of our most heralded bands like a minor threat they were around for two and a half fucking years yeah and, and it's like i can't i can say yeah like obviously there's a cultural impact that comes i actually think more so from discord now than overall for minor threat we're like they're not they're not kings to us you know they're not kings to us you know like we can move forward in this world because there's bands that have been around in my timeline for 25 30 fucking years so been yeah. around for 35 years at this point actually yeah 36. to me like the biggest the biggest contribution 
from a band like Minor Threat to me is that the bands that I love love them. Other than that, I don't really think about Minor Threat much. You know, they they put in like a really short run and happened to inspire the people that really laid it, laid out the bl- blueprint, which is like the agnostic fronts and stuff like that. You know, but yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm not a big minor threat fan. I appreciate it. But when I see like the, you know, the pedestal they're put on for the, uh, the time they put in, ah, that kind of bothers me if I'm honest. Well, I feel like there's a moment where people want to relegate and reinvent history to elevate these people to a status that goes beyond the work and time in. Obviously, if you're first, you're Italian nights, nice. you're not first, you're last. Mm-hmm. But at a certain point, there's refinement and there's uh, excellence of execution that comes off of like taking someone's original design and taking it further. And that's commercially why I think a stripped down pure hardcore sound is never going to be a commercial success. And I think in every single facet, that was the point of the music, like um, the stimulators. And um, there's a couple bands from the late seventies specifically who were basically kind of told you miss the sound, the sex pistols is over. And they were like, well, fuck this. Then we're going to play faster. <laughs> and there's a, there's a fuck, there's a fuck you value. Yeah. Like yeah, and in uh, hardcore, we like that. We like we like bands that don't cooperate, kind of, you know. And uh, the mainstream society, they don't like that. And they what they do like are stories of of rock stars and personalities and Axl Rose types and this and that. And that's something in our scene we don't like. Now that's like what we don't tolerate. If we ever had, no matter how good the hardcore band was, if they were the greatest hardcore band in the history of the scene, if they came in and they acted a fool for long enough, it would just be a matter of time before every show they did, they'd got their ass kicked wherever city they went to. You know what I mean? But I think when people don't deal with, with uh, people personally and just reading about Motley Crue and you're loving the crazy antics and you're reading about, poison and this guy did this and he fucked this little girl and he fucking broke a bottle over this guy we love the crazy antics but in the scene the hardcore scene we don't deal with them too well you know what i'm saying so for those personalities to get big and and escape the scene this scene they, they would never have a chance to even like grow you know what i mean if you understand what i'm saying i don't know if i'm saying it properly but That's another thing the mainstream loves is a good story about a wild, crazy person. But somehow they have lawyers and they have managers and they they cooperate enough to get by and sign multi-million dollar contracts. Where in the hardcore scene, we don't really tolerate disrespectful people. But at the same time, when it comes to the legal, the legal perspectives and and managers and lawyers, we don't really like that. You know what I mean? It, it's, uh, we're almost our own worst enemies in order of, you know, when it comes to success, you know? Well, it's almost like there's a moment where we shoot ourselves in our foot or a counterpoint would be that because it's always been a street culture and it's a movement. It's a movement of people that want to live by their own beat, that there's so many different, like, you know, like, an, um, there's so many different spokes on the wheel. And there's, I think this is the best time in hardcore. Obviously, it's we're 40 something years in here. There's a place for everybody in the world of what they can listen to, the shows, there's artists that they want to check out. There's 40 something years of innovation and variety and some eccentric humans and, you know, some innovation musically. There's so many different things out there. Whereas, you know, hip hop has had small, small, and continual development and metal. I think actually metal is kind of at a point where it's almost becoming a parody of itself in a way that when something you talked about with the, um, with the little rappers comes to mind with like, it's all digital. Now you see the youngest metal core stuff is more tied into the little things than anything. And, and we'll get into that in a second. But what I was getting at is that hardcore, 
it's going to stay like a small boutique independent chain forever. And it's fucked up because, you know, uh, if you think about black metal, black metal has been around less time than hardcore. And obviously there's like the cultural uh, appropriation from the urban fitter outfitters crowd of being like, I'm really only into this black metal. And they like the, the dumb black t-shirts, the shitty logos. And they made the couple God awful movies, but all them dudes, all them dudes are legit. Like in, in the sense where, you know, they're people who have brought their scene from metal into black metal. Their story isn't that far dissimilar from the hardcore people that took the 77 punk era and turned the beats up and turned it into hardcore. It's very similar. Yeah. It just spanned 10 years differently before they diverged away from like the new Obin, like uh, the stuff that influenced Metallica 10 years later. That's when the influence came in Northern Europe to make black metal. There's even fucking movies about black metal. There's not been the commercial movie for hardcore. And I guess this gets back to the original question. Do we want one? Do we want more jerk offs coming in and, and buying a fucking t-shirt and putting it on and being like, see, I'm like you? Or are we happy being like, you know what? Good. Don't fuck with our shit. Let our shit stay small. Yeah, well, I think we do want one, but then we don't want the the product that comes after it. But we do want it. We, you know, there's this weird like contradiction. We know we deserve to be recognized uh we we know that but then with you know with being recognized comes the things you mentioned some people some undesirables and we are you know it's it, it is an exclusive scene you mentioned gatekeeping i think it's a really invited open scene but you got to kind of play your cards right you just can't be you can't be a a, a fucking jerk off like bottom line it's just it's you're not going to last long like, you know, we could find example after example, like some of the the, the most well-known bands when they operated on a jerk off level, they disappeared after after a time. And then some bands play forever and ever. Why does a band like All Out War keep on playing and always uh, welcome whatever city they go? Gentlemen. Because they're gentlemen. Fucking they're those gentlemen. kind of dudes. They don't they're not rock stars. They're not trying to be rock stars. They're trying to play All Out War. And there's only one all at war. When they come to town, you get all at war. But they are always invited, always welcome, and always, you know, appreciated because of their personalities. Like, let's say there was a, a band 10 times better than all at war, but they didn't really get along with people. They didn't keep their word. They didn't act right. It wouldn't matter how good fucking they were. You know what I'm saying? You already know this. You know, I'm telling people that are already know this. So, yeah, we want that movie. We want the rest of the world to kind of know what a great special thing we have. But then we would have to be prepared for the influx of, you know, fucking jerk offs to come around because that's what happens. have to put the gate up. Yeah. And when you have a metal show, it's kind of like, OK, you got the metal show, like a bigger metal band comes through and it's at a faceless club. Who owns it? Nobody knows. Who are these bouncers? Nobody knows. Who are the booking agents? Nobody cares. And you almost feel if I'm going to act a fool, I could act a fool here. There's no repercussion. I'm going to get thrown out by the bouncer that has no connection to this, to the to the metal scene anyway, you know. In our thing, it's different. Everything is connected. It's taken care of internally. And uh, that's what I like about it. So anything, any if if getting bigger means that changes, I'm happy to just keep it where it's at because it's, it's at a great level. You know, we could still, we still have a handful of bands that make a living off this. We still have tons of bands that get to tour and play in front of people. And, and we have ways of listening to their music wherever now with the internet or own sites. You know, I mentioned lawyers before. Like, I don't want a lawyer unless it's a hardcore dude that happens to be a lawyer. I don't want an accountant unless a, a, an accountant happens to have spent time in the hardcore scene. I don't want any prof I don't want to deal with any professional guy when it comes to music unless they're from this scene. You know, and I think that's uh like, I'm not going to be, you know, if I'm the best rapper in the world and my label says, let me uh, recommend a, a lawyer for you. They're going to recommend some lawyer that has no connection to the rap scene unless he also, you know, represented some other rappers. That's about his his extent of his, you know, being connected. But with us, everything. If I'm somebody's making a shirt, an artist, I don't go outside the scene for that to some well-known. 
you know, it's, it's inside the scene. If somebody's going to download this podcast for me, it's a guy within the scene. If somebody's going to make a logo for it, it's a guy within the scene. So that, you know, I, I'm happy to keep it like this, but I still want that fucking movie. Let's, I, let's, let's make it happen. <laughs> I want to see, I would like to see Bad Brains, Murphy's Law, Agnostic Front be in, in, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And yo, everyone you just mentioned there, there is a legitimate strong reason why they should be. They have the time in, they have the cultural importance. They're actually like, there's some, it's so fucked up to get old. And I'm Their not cultural old. relevance I'm not. of the bands you mentioned are so important. And I it's, think people don't realize, but once, once highly successful people start mentioning, and they would if these people were inducted, how important those bands were to them, other people that know nothing about it would be like, oh, shit, holy shit. But the cultural cultural relevance among those bands you mentioned, extremely important. Vince Vaughn was the name of the actor that I was just thinking about. Oh, yeah, the tall guy from Chicago. Yeah, he, he has some really old, archaic T-shirts that, like, you have to know to know. Like, it's OG shit. And he'll pop up with one of them. And some, I've seen a couple people like, yo, where the fuck did he get that shirt from? And that dude's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, anyway. So it's already like, yeah. damn, dog. So I was like, but, oh, he's an old hardcore dude? Yeah, like a legit, but like he's a DL old hardcore dude. Nice. Like he's from the he's from the era when you had to know to know. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't get it off the rack. He was at the show, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah, it was, so, it was hard back in the day to stay like in. in you had to. It was you a full time job to stay in. in the circle. Yeah, it was a full time job to know what was going on. If you didn't research, if you didn't spend your off time finding shit out, you didn't know where to go for a fucking show. You didn't know where to go to, to buy a record. You didn't know a record was out. So yeah, dudes like that, they, they they did their homework. They earned it. Well, like one of the things that you're talking about in reference to like when you say the movie is like the idea, the the beautiful thing about hardcore. And this is this is the the sonic difference and also the social impact difference. Name somebody who's twenty two years old who's starting a hair metal band right now. You can't. No. You might be able to find, and in fact, uh, shout out to uh, Xavier from Year of the Knife. Uh, over COVID, he got himself into producing Boom Bat Beeps, and he put out his own record. It's total hip hop, but like legit. And it's like you don't hear younger folks dial back into the OG shit, but there are people from Rat and LA Guns and Warrant who still don't have to have a regular job because they made money. Yeah. Whereas in the same time frame, there's a 20 year old kid who wants to sound like Minor Threat. There's a 20 year old kid who actually knows what Husker Do is. And thinks that band's cool because of the internet. So this was the flip of the conversation. Commercial success is not equal or as important as cultural value, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And, and you're not going to find you're not going to find like the uh, in in twenty years from now, nobody's going to be googling. Uh, I don't know, fucking. Little, little Dirk or whatever fucking name. Nobody's going to be I, Googling, listening to his shit or saying, but there will be a young ass motherfucker who's going to be Googling a hundred demons in 20 years from now. Guaranteed. Well, that's and, exactly it. It's or even point. newer band uh, expire or, you know, whoever you name them, you know, but th those bands are going to always be have interest because that's just how the scene is. This is, it's a great thing, and it's also kind of a, a pain in the ass thing. But within the hardcore scene, there's a lot of respect given to older bands that don't play anymore. Where in the hip hop scene, it's almost like no respect given to those those outfits. Uh, unless the underground hip hop, it's its own thing. They always show reverence. Yeah, the love the love yeah. given to MF Doom uh, two weeks ago was outstanding. Yeah, and that's that's because he was. He had his place in that underground scene where lyricists are appreciated and this and that. But the, the mainstream, the, the ones that are doing 20, 30, 40 million downloads of some nonsensical rap song, 
they don't know MF Doom. They don't give a fuck. They don't know KRS One. They don't give a fuck. Well, that's exactly know? it. The commercial... And they're happy to say that. They're happy to even be disrespectful to the roots of their thing, which you don't you don't find in in hardcore. You know. Well, because there's a, still a social element within the culture, so like, yeah, you can say that amongst your like nut ass friends, like, yo, want some real shit, man? What the fuck does victim and pain ever did for me? Yada yada yada. Yeah. You say that around someone who who gets it, they're going to put you to school and they're going to say, here's every reason why this record's important. And everything that you have is still tied in. There's nothing tied into low, whatever. I like the word low, but I don't, I don't know them. Besides little Dicky, I don't know. And, and, and little baby because of Carl, because Carl loves that little baby dude. I don't know anything about that whole world, except for the fact that it has no cultural relevance to me. Um, yeah, he's a little dicky, a uh, Philly dude. Yeah, uh, right outside the city near like where we do jujitsu. And Anthony E Town's actually his manager. Anthony. Yo, he could spit though. The kid has skills, bro. I, I, yeah. So, as I say, I don't pay attention to the little stuff. I still follow Sway and the Five Fingers of Death. Um, obviously, I love everything that is associated and incorporated with Vinny Paz and Jedi Mind and Army of the Pharaohs and Vinny Heavy Paz is a killer. Ill Bill and Necro because there's still a beautiful use of very crazy ideas in a lyrical way with crazy beats. And I feel like the importance of Vinny Paz and his music is that where we were talking about hardcore punk where they said, all right, we're just going to take the cesspistols and speed it up. He was like, oh, you guys want to rap about like selling selling drugs and girls and all this shit? I'm going to rap about chopping your fucking head off and worshiping Satan. And, you know, like he takes some lyrics in a lot of different directions. He actually had a lot of really social, socially important records like R.A., The Rugged Man. Like there's a lot of crazy people involved. Yeah, that hip hop scene is is something special. And, it's and you know what? It, it's really good because they they can make a living. They can draw the people, they can get the streams and the numbers, and they can still have complete control. It's almost like the 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 way that that hip hop scene ended up is like the prime example of how something should be. It's like bigger than our thing, but it's still theirs. It was never taken away. They still own it, you know, and they do what they want. Then it's kind of like we do all those things, but we just don't get the numbers. But then again, it's harder to, you know, for the average person to listen to somebody screaming their head off than the smooth, you know, flow and approach of a Vinny Paz. Like the, the shit is just really good. But I like what that scene has done with its culture because it's, it's not the same as the hip hop that is, you know, on this next level, as far as these guys are wearing $8 million chains and shit like that, all this clown show stuff and cars and, and then no lyrics and no control over their own shit and, and no interest in the next thing or tomorrow, no interest in the history of their own thing. You know what I mean? I like, I like that rap scene, the underground rap scene, the immortal technique types and all of that. It's like, there's a lot oh, yeah. of good shit out there. I can't believe I skipped over immortal technique. Cause I feel like he probably is another one of them founding people. Cause that, when he started doing it, in fact, I, um, I got Sonny really into um, a lot of battle raps. Cause mm. I remember at high school, that was a huge thing. Like that was like, Oh, you know, like, and then like, not yeah. like, like, like legit. And I've always enjoyed that element. And I, and simultaneously both Vinny Paz and John Joseph and Ray Capo were all on the biggest podcast in America and the world. That's sick. <laughs> and you think that is it, sick. It's like, it's like, and then, um, so we're at hate breed at the last time. Hate breed played through Philadelphia. And, uh, I was like, how we? I said to Scott Vogel, I was like, how weird is it? We're in a room with two dudes that run the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> you know, like it's a it's a surreality that even when our culture is overlooked in the bigger sense of the world, champions of our culture, which Vinny Paz is actually both a champion of hardcore and hip hop, for sure. It's true, like legit young boy going to Turning Point, City Gardens, all that shit he did. Before he ever made his name in hip hop, yeah, that, like, that dude knows know, his stuff. The history of hardcore, he knows his stuff. Like, but it's like these are these are paragons in their communities, John, Vinny, Ray, who are interesting enough culturally that Joe Rogan finds commercial. I mean, 
I, I respect Joe enough to not say that he only has them to elicit cult commercial success because obviously there's he could be talking to much bigger actors, actresses, etc. But it's just totally cool. he could pay, he could say he could give the word out, he could get Madonna on there. Yeah, but he thing. reached out to a John Joseph type. That's fucking dope. Right. What's crazy is is like so they he's real. Like not like he's obviously a real person. The man legitimately texts like his old guests. So he hit up Vinny, be like, yo, are you doing good? And or like he'll hit up like John loves texting with him. John's always in the dude's comments. But like there's a realness, even and this is kind of funny, but there's a realness in the semblance of commercial success through Joe Rogan, which I think in part is why I think if the podcast that we're now producing have any kind of hope for uh any kind of conducting and promoting hardcore culture there has to come from a real sense and this is you know goes back to the thing i said in the beginning it could be off the backs of the current wave of hardcore podcast to get people beyond our own world to like really think about the culture as a whole and that's what got my brain thinking like well why why aren't we talking to the oldest people why are, like before they all pass away obviously he lost jack flanagan um Kenny from oh what the fuck I always forget his name like to me there's so many fucking bands that lost already and that, that's like another thing I'm doing on a different cast for my own personal yeah talk, like brain like I gotta I gotta I gotta know these stories I gotta find these yo these out. motherfuckers are getting old though you're not wrong you and know what I'm like, saying <laughs> and, and there's missing links in the history for us that we can all glean from but um when I think about you it, it, you're a very unique person in so many facets because you have a respect that is like beyond admirable there you understand the curation of this culture and you got into it at the stage as we talked about in episode seven you got into it right in that early 90s boom so you have a love for war zone and the older shit but your your musical focus was always on whatever was out at that time frame Crutch would go on to do everything it needed to do. And in the early 2000s, you were playing out to win. You shifted gears completely into wisdom and chains. And it was kind of like a new game for you. And I mean, not by like a game, but it was, like, it was a new test. It was a new task. And, you know, obviously that was a goon motherfucking time for music. Like if you didn't have breakdowns, it was hard for you to establish yourselves. But here you are as of this year, you're playing with every single band that a band that sounds like wisdom and chains would want to play with agnostic front street dogs, the fucking gorilla biscuits, you know, um, H2O, you know, like you manage through toil and like constantly doing weekend tours and, and going out on these European runs and writing music that is unequiv unequivocally unique to you, wisdom and chains, but has so many, different homages and touches on different styles within hardcore that you're one of these very interesting people as far as you can sit down with the kids of code orange and they're your homies you can sit to, you know justice is like a little brother to you you know like you've managed to be a mentor and a brother to so many of the newer people coming in and you're a peer to so many people within the most established elements of hardcore fuck how many times you guys play with cox bar now like it's got to feel weird to you to be into your third decade of playing music. And every time we talk, you're excited about new stuff too. You're not like, oh, hardcore's over. You're constantly pushing forward. I wanted to know where do you get that energy from knowing that, you know, there's no yeah. there's no David Lee we're off money in this. Well I love the scene and uh from day one I always worked. I always had, you know, financially I said if I want to do this, I gotta make money. And uh, I'm not going to gamble on trying to make money from this. And plus, if I put my focus into trying to make money off hardcore, I might lose the love, which could happen. But I've been lucky because I dealt with like those older bands that I love, the Vinny Stigma type people that always showed respect, treated me so good. And then when somebody like that, you know, gives you that lesson, then you're going to pass it on. You're going to, you know, you're going to be respectful and, and nice to everybody else. And, uh, when Wisdom first started, music was definitely goonish. The hardcore scene was heavy and all my friends' bands, you know, down tuning, the, the guttural vocals, the heavy shit. And it was good. I love that stuff. But it was almost like I'm always like a uh, 
a pain in the ass, uh, like to argue kind of guy. So I wanted to come out anyway and be like melodic. And I was not even really into any melodic hardcore, but I figured, and I wouldn't say Wisdom and Chains is overly melodic, but at the time it just didn't fit in. But it was almost kind of like why I wanted to do it. Cause I wanted to see, could I play shows with no retreat and fucking as wisdom and chains or people can be like, what the fuck is this? You know? And, uh, but it worked out. People like that, like those bands were open to us and they were cool. And then they started singing along. And then they, it was like during our set, it was a little different than the set before it or after it, it became, it's kind of its own thing. And, uh, I wanted to cover Cox bar. Cause I felt like, you know, why don't many dudes in my scene know about Cox bar? You know what I mean? Like, let me give them a little taste, see if it, and, and I felt like, you know, they weren't that different, you know, and there was, there was room for wisdom and change. People were open to it, even though it was a real heavy scene and it would slowly change. And I think more melodic bands came into play later on and we fit in a little better. My only thing was like, I thought that a punk scene and an oi scene would be more open to us, but we never really got any offers or recognition on that side of things, you know, like we'd more likely be asked to do a tour with, uh, I don't know, like, you know, just, just name the heavy band from wherever, you know, we, like well, all out war, I'll name them again. Of, that's we, like you, you managed to be the band that all the guys in the heaviest bands go, man, this guy's fucking great. Or like, I booked you guys with Mike Judge, and Mike Judge is like, I don't know if I want to play after Wisdom and Change in Pennsylvania. Oh, I love like, Judge. I love Judge. You should have never only, said that, though. You should never it, say that. And then uh, this is like two years after they came back, and he's like, I, I don't think we could do this. I'm like, dude, you're Judge. But Yo, like, you know what happened? It was a Judge story. When Judge was first coming back for the uh, Black and Blue Bowl, I was on the, the radio show they used to do in the Lower East Side. And because uh, Joe was like, yo, you excited for uh, – for judge to come back and i'm like yeah maybe he's like what do you mean maybe and i'm like i don't know did did he sell out you know and, and cuz i was talking about money and he said <laughs> so i'm like oh no i was like, i don't care I was, I was like they deserve to get all the money they could get i'm talking about like straight edge did he sell out you know and uh, i got home that night and then i had a message on facebook and it was from uh mike judge and he said hey man uh i was <laughs> i was listening to the radio show and i just want to say you know, I don't know what you think straight edge is, but if it means drinking and smoking and shit like that, no, I didn't sell out. And I was like, oh, shit, I like that, you know. But uh, I always love Judge, and, and to me, that's one of the best full-length albums from any hardcore band is, is, is their first album. That's so dope. But, yeah, we were lucky, man. Like, But like, we, we were more likely back then to get, like, asked to do a weekend with Candiria than we were to do a weekend with, like, a more punk band or something like that. So this was always our scene, regardless how we sounded. And uh, I intentionally throw a lot of heavy metal shit into wisdom and chains here and there, but in its own way, you know, but uh, yeah, it's definitely more melodic than a lot of the other bands, but people were always good to us. And, and we, we never felt like the odd man out for the most part, you know, and the lessons we learned from the dudes above us that were older and treated as good the same you know same way we would act towards any younger cats because why would you want to be a dick you know what i'm saying like we ain't making money like that you know we're like maybe our our show our show popped off and it might look great to somebody but now we got to go hide in the back because the show was dope i don't get it like you know what i mean like this is the hardcore scene for a reason like it's the reason is we're all in it together the stage like you know we want to see people up on stage other genres of music they'd be like get those fucking people off the stage you know it's just something they're not used to we're used to seeing roger sell behind the merch table selling his fucking shit like i'm to this day you know we just did that tour with him not even a year ago that motherfucker was standing at the merch booth talking to everybody who would come around could another band do that or would they want to do that nah you know they would want to walk around with security and, and a look on their faces you know this is some different shit man so if people are respectful and have nice things to say about me or the band. I appreciate that, man. Definitely. Because to me, the scene, you're only as good as your reputation. Well, think about the couple years back, someone had said to Mike Tyson about Mayweather saying he was the greatest champ of all time. 
And Tyson had said, if that man was the greatest champ of all time, he wouldn't need to have security to go pick up his kids at the high school. He said Muhammad Ali could walk anywhere in the entire world, and he was recognized and respected as a champ. And I think that that correlates back into the bigger picture of this conversation, where commercial success doesn't guarantee cultural value. And cultural value, although does not pay the lion's share of living expenses, it's like that, uh, you remember um, Donnie Brasco? Mm -hmm. You know who I am? I'm known in the five boroughs. My family can walk their head in the five boroughs. And yeah, (laughs) Roger can fucking sell merch at any fucking hardcore show in the world. No one's going to rip them off of money. No one's going to be afraid of him. They're just going to be excited to say hello to a godfather in our entire thing. And the fact that we're living in a very precipitous time. And that's another reason why uh, I was want, I was hoping to have this kind of discussion with you specifically. And it's sad to say, ten years from now, people we've mentioned on the show may not be here anymore. Oh shit! We should start and making bets. <laughs> have the death pool, <laughs> but that's the gimmick. Is where these younger folks now. I mean, in my timeline, a lot, obviously a lot of younger people always pass in hardcore. But you remember, we did this show at H2O, we got Wisdom of Chains on it, Vision jumps on it. They open up with the Boston gimmick. Dave immediately says, I'll tell you when it's our last fucking show. And backstage, he's like, I don't know why he was saying, you know, I'm moving. Um, he was moving from one state to another. And mm-hmm. he was like, I don't know why that guy was saying we're going to Pete tab it. He's like, I, I don't know why Pete was telling you it's a last show. I remember Pete was like, hey, this is our last show. So we put on the flyer last show. And I got a phone call like four hours later from like Dave being like, this is our fucking last show. Like, I don't know why he's telling you this. And they got on oh, stage shit. and said, I'll tell you when it's our last fucking show. And backstage, he's like, look, if we ever do a last show, of course you're doing this. This is the hard part for me. As a like you know, basically as a child, I see Envision so many times when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, and I was like a punisher. I'd say, Hey Dave, what's up? Just because in hardcore, the guy's like, Hey, what's going on? And because I went to a show with everybody up in Brunswick, he said like he knew, oh, he's with Jamie and old school Alex and all these guys. So when I got to do vision, I got to do vision two separate times at this hardcore and a handful of times on shows visions. like a like a, like one of my favorite bands up there, like right up, right up there next to killing time. Unintentionally that ended up being the last fucking show vision or played Cause Dave passed three days later. Yeah. That's insane. Right. And it fucks me up because it's like he unequivocally was like, I'll tell you when we're fucking done. And so, I mean, like I could tell you, I had to sit down when someone told me uh, rabies died. We were at a show like, just so you know, rabies died. Damn. Dude, we were like, what the? F-? That's like, like, what, what do you do? Like, and I know that this sounds crazy to young kids, but he was like, it's not like any person that's popular and hardcore today that's in a band has more of a big name because of social media. And you see all these pictures of this person. I don't care if you're the kid from fucking King Nine, if you're a fucking dopey ass Bob Wilson, Keith from Payback, any of you young motherfuckers, more people know what you look like, what you ate last night. So there's a figure of presence of like symbolic cultural importance in rabies. Because unless you saw him at a show or you saw his band, you didn't see him on the internet. But I like. Yeah, he never made a tweet. Yeah, he never fucking tweeted once. But his <laughs> cultural importance. We think about that. Like, why, the, why, why were we loving Ray B's before we even knew that motherfucker? Just because it's lyrics on that fucking piece of paper. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we, we, like, we, we knew this guy was like one of the leaders of our thing before we met him. You know, he was an important, important cat. Well, cycling through this whole conversation, he told us. Don't forget the struggle and don't forget the streets and always keep the faith. Mm-hmm. And like, that's a, that's a 10 in the hardcore. Like if that's like a fucking, if there was like a, 
if there was a couple adages that had to be at the fucking at, you give this to every person like here's here's your notebook now that you're in hardcore oh by the way this is a rule don't forget the struggle don't forget the streets yeah and always keep the faith yeah you know like i'd seen warzone a handful of times he passed and i felt like well, what the fuck happens now, obviously, there was a thousand million bands, Earth Crisis, 25 to Life, Bulldoze. Every fucking band was killing it at that time frame. But there was no more rabies. Mm-hmm. And that's like a fucked up thing to young, I got maybe not to young kids. I don't know. But like, that's where we're at in the world right now. Like, the, um, well, who, I, do you, who do you think will be the next John Joseph to represent this group of hardcore kids? When you say this, twenty group, you, to thirty years from now, you mean the this current specific- the current group of hardcore kids, the generations from twenty to th- to thirty five, like who is their John Joseph going to be? Um, Justice is up there. Mm, yeah, Justice is right up there. Um, culturally, very fucking important, and his ability to be musically talented beyond just being like the dude in one band and the future of his like current songwriting trajectory, he could be the John Josephs. Um, there's always the fact that Scott Vogel's never going to actually die. <laughs> like, he's just like a fucking vampire and just lives. Meanwhile, like, he should be dead before everybody. That guy, the way he operates. Dude, but like he's just gonna outlive the world. But like yeah. I would say, unless he does another couple tours with Wisdom and Chains, and him and Luke team up, uh, that, yeah, Luke will, that might Luke, be the, the, the Luke might be the end of him. So we got to keep that keep those tours not not from happening. Luke takes Luke takes one year off of Vogel's. Uh, he takes life. one year off everybody's <laughs> life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would have to say in 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 in, in terms of context, uh, contextual importance. John Joseph's being the singer of the Chromax is an insane figure. And the way that he's pivoted and the way he's continued to pivot his life, Justice is on that vibe, man. He yeah, you might be that, right. I wasn't even thinking about that, that but you're he right. Has that, he has that amazing ability. And I feel like I feel like the Justice of today is such a more diverse and interesting human than he was when he was just trying to look look cool on stage. And I'll even mm-hmm. admit that. And um, I would say if we're going to that far, like world known, respected hardcore dude, Justice is right the fuck up there. I find that actually in 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 correlation to what you were saying about stars and such and, and its placement in hardcore, there are less stars in the modern age of hardcore singers and more people in the other aspects in the other instruments that are way more the popular person. I would say that like with the exception of Aaron Hurd from Jesus peace, uh, there's a few singers who have that like social currency and like, look, I hate to use the term star power here, but that's, we'll just use it because it's the easiest to reference. Yeah. The younger folks have this, like this, like my judge type kind of vibe. Where if you talk to Mike, he doesn't want to talk in 10 people. He wants to talk to you alone or with like two people. Like singers and hardcore today are like, hey man, how you doing? Um, I'm just wondering if uh they're not like bolsterous or no fucking Ezaks by any stretch, not even the ridiculously like cartoonish like a Jorge or the psycho like <laughs> Kev one. Like they're not characters. They're just like straight up psycho down. like Kev one. <laughs> hey, Kevin, <laughs> hey man, I need a fucking giant bottle of fucking kettle one. Yeah. And Ten minutes later, she's a vodka yet. And I'm like, uh, I'm still figuring out what kettle one was. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I never thought about that. I think they are more on the quiet, timid side, like a lot of the, Dude, the, the front singers. It's interesting. And so what happens is it's like the uh the emperor has no clothes kind of like vibe where they get on there and then they're like, then they open up. My favorite current singer who is in a juxtaposition of being an older cat. With a huge young audience is Jay Peter from Mind Force. Mm. But in relation to it, because he's an older cat, he's a fucking got his own gimmick. 
you know, he has a fucking great stage presence and a sound. The Pillars of Ivory demo was the fucking tracks of the year last year. Um, that was I, really cool. That's I, such like, a cool releases. I, I like I like I think about him as being the modern representation of my generation of hardcore singers. You know, like you can't mm-hmm. say an Aaron Buckus like a death threat Aaron because do love smoking weed and chilling on some side shit. Like it's not that he's not affable and con- has conversation. In fact, he's a great person to speak with, but he's just a little quiet in his own, and or he's out in some smoke session just. Yeah, you know I mean, and it up and talking about he is slightly, stuff. slightly mysterious. Yes, I'm going to be um, talking to him on an uh, upcoming episode. Fuck yeah. Um, COA would have been, but now he's just a, just a maniac, just out Yo, in uh, what fucking a New Hampshire. But like, crazy he, because he's from a time, his he's a representation of an older time, like he's an update version of like the fucking Tony Herb as a face value. And the problem is, is the kids like how Winds of Machines was playing with the hard bands. COA should have been playing with like the casualties where he's like out there threatening people like they would have loved that shit. You know? Yes. He's a total throwback. Was It's actually like, I'm going to show you fucking fake tough guys. This is what's really tough. It's getting yourself face bloody. And you're like, uh, you fucking maniac. <laughs> yeah, he's he's like an agitator. He's uh really good front man though the personality on him is so crazy so cool i was in one time i was in and over here in, in the u.s he always wore i call it a terrorist scarf it's like that that yeah, neck yeah, piece yeah. that kind of like looks like the print that the terrorists always wear well over in in europe he had one just like that but it was an american flag right and i said oh what happened to the terrorist scarf you always wear he's like Oh, I wear that at home to to upset people at home, but out here I wear this to upset the people here. <laughs> That's just like the type of dude, you know what I mean, that you want in that kind of band, like the total intense agitator. Well, that's exactly it. So, like, John Joseph is a provocator and an agitator at times, and he's going against the grain of so many concepts. And it's actually an interesting dichotomy in that to so many older people, he's an inspiration of like positivity, uh, show of a trajectory of change. But then younger people are like, uh, why is he talking about vaccines so much? Like they're looking at more like politically because he's an older guy who aligns differently. And I, it's interesting to see yeah. the juxtaposition of two separate cultures at the same time, viewing someone in different ways. So um, I definitely find that justice that probably is like if off the top off the top of my head really the one who has the most cultural value for people to have that kind of reverence and being like oh he's like you know like you also can't be named like J- like you know like me like if i didn't if some asshole didn't call me joe hardcore because of a tribe 13 song no one would know who the fuck joe mckay is you know what i mean like but you call justice trip people are gonna fucking remember your name you know what i mean like it's yeah how's that a, even his real name that's a cool name right Dude, it's fu- you know, um, my mother, her father was named John, and there was one moment where she said to me, "I was going to name you after my father," so I sh- sh- would have been named John Joseph Flanagan because my mother's name wow. is Flanagan. So I was yeah. almost named John. You would have Joseph been Flanagan. fighting yourself internally, internally at war with myself, and as soon as I. As soon as yeah. I would have came across the Cro-Mags, I wouldn't know what side to pick. I'm actually uh, going to have I, uh, I have a set date to interview Paris, and then I'm doing John. I'm doing this thing. We're going to start talking about podcast stuff that we're both doing in, in the relationship to the hardcore. I'm doing. Two Are you going to bring a talk about the to the guys to each other or no? I have a I have. Will a you set talk to Paris point. about John and vice versa? Here's what I know of Paris is that he has the aggros, which I think is a really cool project. I know that for me personally, when I think about Paris, I think about a guy who can go ahead and talk about a depth of film and video and just shit that's just so much more interesting than him giving a third perspective. And then because I am personal friends with John, it's a thing where I do not want to see a friend be injured and I don't want to use my platform as the kids say to allow someone to attack someone else 
So I feel what what's going to happen is I'm going to ask John, I'm going to ask Paris about stuff that happened before hardcore even began. I have a couple mm-hmm. things that I think he's going to really illustrate and back up. And he probably throw me some curveballs of things I haven't thought about in my ideas on what hardcore, the, the nature of hardcore but I look at Paris as being someone who, if had there been no Paris Mayhu, I don't believe hardcore would have sounded the same way. And I think that I put him in, insanely important in the record of hardcore because, and, I, and I'm one, and I, I have to talk to him because I've never seen really interesting interviews of, with him where he discusses why. I want to see if Kill 'em All is an interesting or the No Life to Leather demo. I want to find out if he's a tape trader. I want to see where the metal that would eventually become the age of quarrel material, where it got its genesis from. What what made him write that? Because unequivocally, the Chromag's age of quarrel material is considered to be the first really metallic release from a New York hardcore band. And there was some wordplay and some timeline differences where someone would argue and say, well, the unruled, which was eventually be leeway or doing metallic stuff but i don't have any music by that so i don't know if that's really legit but we do know that obviously chromax came out after kill them all so i'm wondering if that material because it was there on the no life to leather because it was all underground how much thrash metal influenced him and I, but you gotta remember is he was there at the very beginning so it'd be a very interesting story to see how he metallicized new york hardcore It'll be yeah. very inter- it'll be very interesting to hear him talk about his filmmaking career. And um, I know from reading other things in the past that he's brought up John Watson, the original St. Arrow Crow Mags a lot. And I actually heard a really cool ass story from uh Todd Youth, who obviously passed away, about a, a fight that happened in Philly when a bunch of New York guys came down to my old neighborhood to a, a venue. And he said John Watson was a pure ass kicker. So I look forward to positive conversations where people who are listening get more than the usual Paris versus John and Paris versus Harley. And then um, as I talk to John, he's moving in a different direction, almost not, not unlike a Goggins and not like a Jocko, but John's got this new thing with this John Joseph discipline. And he's like becoming like a personal coach. And and I think that's going to be something really cool. And I want to kind of get him to speak on how he goes from, being in a true depths of legitimate addiction and just by his own self admission, like a thief and a drug addict. And like, what, what, like, what were the, what were the steps and what did he do to go from being someone who had nothing together for himself and, and how he got to where he's at now, where he's like in full in PMA, he's got the, he's an author, you know, he was on the Joe Rogan. These yeah, are he's, he's of, 59 years old, man. Yeah, man. He's in such good shape. Well, that's like the legitimate thing. Like, where do we go from here? And it'll be so it'll be so awesome for me to have a car- like the kids say character arc. That's more that's the story mm. of John, the character yeah. arc of John. Then you know, I had some dealings with Paris on Facebook. Oh, and I thought he was a real fucking dick, like the way he was acting. To be honest, I don't know him at all, and I always will have to give props because he was on one of the great records. You know. Although his other stuff with the Crow Mags, I thought was goofy. Age of Quarrel was was dope. But he just seemed like a, a real kind of dick the way he was talking on Facebook. And uh, we got into it a little bit. And I did get the hint that he was a, he's a Freemason. So maybe you could uh, un- uncover that if, uh, if you talk to him. Not that being a dick has anything to do with Freemasonry, but just some of the words he was using and stuff he was saying. I felt like this guy might be a Freemason. <laughs> See if you could uncover that mystery. For me, I, I, I think of everybody, I take out any kind of personal nuances because I, I there's been times where I post it and Paris has had stuff. And I I I have gotten to the point where I respect someone's personal perspective. And instead of trying to, it's kind of like you can't take someone out of an embattled position. Like you ever see uh Normandy, the storming of Normandy, and they have yeah. those pill boxes. So I look at some positions that people are in as like pillboxes. Other positions are less impregnable and people have the ability to move. But I feel like because of the nature of Paris Mayhew and, and Chromex and all the different people on the internet who have said things about Paris, et cetera, et cetera, 
that I feel like there's certain positions that he's an impregnable fortress where it's only made to shoot at people. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm interested in where the dichotomy between where his perspective is a PR and where he truly believes it. And that's the thing about it is, is there's an insane energy that comes from age of quarrel and those guys. And I truly in my fucking heart of hearts believe the world should never see a age of quarrel lineup set. And having seen so many different versions of the Cro-Mags, I feel like the, the, the pages of the book have been written and the bands that do the Cro-Mag songs are vetted for the people that are fans of the personages in the band. But when I heard the aggros and like that six minute track, what I saw was a guy, I don't know. This is my presentation. This is not his. Mm -hmm. I saw a guy basically go, if you guys want the Cro-Mags and the sound of the Cro-Mags and what it would be like now, I'm the one who has it. Like I'm the keeper. Remember that um, band Halloween there, the keeper of the seven keys, right? (laughs) Yeah. He's the keeper of the age of quarrel because there's so much fantastic, like sonic presence that is very similar to what Cro-Mags would sound like. But then again, juxtapose that with or put against it uh the blood cat new song with tom capone is fantastic blood class stuff is hard definitely it's relentless sound well you got you go from todd youth and now you got tom capone at the helm involved in this project it is interesting but the nature of what i what i'm trying to do with this podcast um is to disseminate information have good conversations and in the third element provide entertainment like i'm not putting i'm not putting on a show but i try not to get into dark dark corners socially where there's pauses and silences and the flow of conversation to where information and good stories are able to come out is more of where i would take a conversation with someone like paris than draw him into a here's your chance to shit on john joseph and everyone can listen to it or, or vice versa with harley and to be completely trans transparent here through a third party, I reached out to Harley and said, Hey, listen, I'm going to have the other guys on the show. I'm not asking you to get on and attack these guys, but if you got, if you want a presence in this platform, it's there for you to do so. Oh shit. And, the reason, <laughs> well, and the reason why is because you know what I'm going to, I'm going to spend the entire time talking about the stimulators and I'm going to ask him the importance of going to England with his mother or not in England and Netherlands and go in and seeing these punks in 76 and 77 as a child coming back, he was recruited to play drums in the first, arguably the first New York hardcore band. One of the arguments is that there is a tangible, no first, but in the first crop, you know, yeah. Jesse Mallon, Jack Flanagan, we're in the heart. Of, we're in heart attack. There's a couple firsts in that New York world where like the waxing end of the Andy Warhol 70, um, Andy Warhol uh, Max Kansas City stops and other places start and these bands just had to pick up the pace and play faster. Tony Rittman, shout him out. The New York Hardcore book is fantastically important in documenting it. My personal preference is to read things linearly. So the way that he wrote this is he kind of picked people or bands and then as you read the book it'll it actually reads like a facebook in a weird way it it reads like a facebook post like they have this thing up and then people write comments so like it'll say like paris mayho and he'll say like three lines about someone and so it's good to see the people who are around at the time and their perspective specifically on these topics but as someone who reads history and like dry ass history books about the 12th and 11th and 7th and 8th centuries at times it doesn't read like a history book, but it has so much history in it. What's and the name so, of the book? Uh, New York Hardcore, NYHC. Oh, I got to get it's that. It's by Tony Rettman. He also did a Tony. Edge, he also did an, a, a great straight edge book, and he has probably the best book on Detroit hardcore. And um, he writes it under that um, that company called like Bazillion Points Publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I got to check that out. I didn't even know about that. Um, yeah. Uh, I think for me, when I talk to a guy like that, I want to talk about where we can find the most even ground 
where someone listening can learn or where someone listening can understand because there's other places where someone could get him on the show and be like, so uh, who stabbed you at the be you know, at the, at the CBGB fest. Like there are so many dark corners in hardcore where people could go to, but it's not my place. It's not where I want to put my place at. I want to put, yeah, my- no, I see what you're getting at and what you're trying to do. And it's, it's important. It could be really cool. And it might end up making me, like personalities that normally I would have disliked, you well, know. So I'm, and, and I'm anxious to, to see how it goes. And back to the cultural value aspect, you don't have to like everybody that are your heroes, and you don't have to worship your heroes, but you do have to understand that certain times there are unequivocally important roles played by individuals, and then their personality is forever changed. I mean, there is like a funny story about Tom Capone when he wasn't in a good mental state uh, doing a um, reunion with Bold and and, um, the asylum. Now, this is all third party, so I'm doing something where I'm regurgitating a story from Bridge Nine board. But then it was also explained to me by someone who was there, so it's still hearsay, but I'm going to say it in in order that Tom Capone was playing a less than well-attended show for Bold and when he was playing in bold in the reunions in the mid two thousands and they were playing at bogeys or someone in Albany and it was not going so well. And he kicked the monitor off the stage. It was like, I was in fucking quicksand or something crazy like that. Oh shit. But that doesn't take away from the fact that Tom Capone is a great musician. He's got his whole entire life together. We saw them with bold two years back and they were fucking <laughs> great. He has a huge hand in blood clot. Like if, so, what I guess is, is people can have bad actions. They can have a good cultural value on things that they've worked and done in hardcore, and they can have bad moments or they can have bad takes. You know, and I'm not separating the artist from the artist. It's actually saying like, human beings are not married to their ideals, and they're not representative as humans for their um, artistic output. You know, and it's been proven that some of the greatest artists were some of the worst people but you can respect the art and not give a fuck about the person. But also in, in, in reference to like talking to a Paris or talking to a Harley, I feel like my job with what I want to feel a complete discussion happens is when the end listener, the person listening right now clicks on a Harley Flanagan episode and they don't hear 35 minutes straight of what he would say about John Joseph on Instagram every day. I want the side of Harley that someone else didn't have. And that's why you can have a conversation with Scott Vogel. Uh, Hoya can have a conversation with Scott Vogel. I can have a conversation with Scott Vogel. Everyone can talk to Scott Vogel and we're all going to take a different side from him. And every one of the people who are listening to our podcast will enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like there's no need to echo, there's no need to echo extent information about how someone already feels And in tying this whole thing back to the podcast meets modern day zine culture, the biggest aspects and problems with the zine culture of the time was the same reason why the virility of bad uh, stories exist on Twitter. Some articles written, and it's like a gotcha title and everyone retweets, 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 and no one disseminates that this information is valid, important, or interesting. And in that same way, Porter punching the guy from, Louisville, Kentucky was written in every zine because it was something that someone went, Oh, I've got the part. I've got the, I've got the the play by play on why Porter punched that guy. You know, like Mm -hmm. you were, it was like a, it was like the fucking weekly world news meet shit talk column. And there was our zines actually written totally about shit talking people. And people wanted to read that before Twitter ever came out. And so if that's someone else's podcast, God bless you. My podcast is about, stories people's perspectives the human element the cultural value history of hardcore in in some respects and so i hope that i don't have to take paris and harley and jj to town in the regard of like hey by the way you already write this all over the internet so people will understand like let's talk about things that you can uniquely identify and put here that someone may not have already heard before. Yeah, it's hard to resist because those three guys are so, you know, they, they, it's so toxic between them. But 
the same three guys are also so important to the scene and history to scene. So that's why I do like your podcast because you know what you want to talk about. You, you have a plan. And, uh, when I listen to yours, I, I expect to hear some stuff that I, you know, th- you, you did some homework before you talk to them. If I listen to like a broad street breakdown podcast, I know I just want the crazy conversation between those three guys, uh, a Hoya podcast. I know he's going to be more, more like fun and lively personal stories with people he dealt with, but yeah, your stuff is uh, you take what you do with the music and booking and you put it into podcast formats, real it's more organized in depth. And uh, like when, when you did that chef dude, I didn't know how I would feel about that if I was going to dig it, but that was really interesting and really dope. And meanwhile, it's a dude I never even knew about, you know what I mean? That was a good one. So like every person in hardcore, if we want to be blanketing statements, every person in hardcore found something about it that touched them. And so our job as podcasters whether we want to talk to our friends and touch the people listening, or we want to have a good time. For me, I, I think of the commonality, the, the shared threads. And when I started the podcast, the ideal scenario would be to talk to someone like a Jamie Bissonnette, who is in our world of hardcore, you know, he wasn't in a, he wasn't in a trapped under right size band, but He's a trapped under a size fucking chef. <laughs> like he's fucking beyond. Yeah, for sure. He's a restauranteer, like owns multiple restaurants in multiple countries. He one shot was a judge. Like he's a success in his world. He and like so, I wanted to talk to people within hardcore who have either a very um, DIY approach and success, and disseminate and explain where, and also as the circular pattern of thinking of guests and the stories that have been encompassing the previous guests are all commonly threaded. Jamie Bissonnette was early on the show as a, I got to have when I was thinking about the idea scenario would to not include the Scott Vogels right away, but to talk about people that have done shit, because if someone can listen to this episode, they're going to hear us talking about the cultural importance and some history and personal thoughts. And there's a fun value to that. And then they listen to Jamie and people reached out to me and said, this personal episode fucked me up because it taught me like the Ernie Talbert episode was one of our shortest episodes. But, you know, the conversation about leaving hardcore to just be a grown ass man and get your job done and hardcore is always going to be here. People were wrote, writing me be like, dude, I needed to hear that. You know, like the talk about access and exposure, the people talk about grinding, like so much about what you did as a musician to tie this all back in, what our forefathers that we've talked about as, as musicians and as a culture, it's all DIY. It's all about hard work, grinding, networking, and supporting. So when you hear about a Jamie Bissonnet who moved from fucking Connecticut to Florida to learn how to cook, to come up and grind his way through and have to stage and work for free to show off his traits, that's like, yo, I don't need no money. We just want to play Philly to a good crowd. Like, if he wasn't mm. talking about cooking, he'd be talking about playing a show for free. We don't need that money. We just want people to know who we are. So, like, yes, his avenue of opportunity was that he was going to try to be a, a cook. But if it was a, the Jamie Bissonette trio and it was a band, the same story and work ethic was applied. Exactly. And, and, and that's the fascinating thing. Like, when he said, I just wanted to work for a person who had the James Beard Award, and then he would end up being – business partners with the guy he wanted to work for and a a recipient of the James Beard Award, that to me alliterates the importance of the values that we were instilled with work hard, DIY, don't give up, all these things that we were told by our forefathers and hardcore and how it applies to your real fucking life. And it's not just, it goes beyond the metric of a cool thing to say in the crowd Hardcore has an emotional value, which is ties back into everything we fucking said about a cultural importance outweighing commercial success value. Yeah, sure. Freddie Mayball, unfortunately, isn't paid as well as a dude from Lincoln Park. I wish in another life it was differently, but that's not the case. But I'm going to say off the rip that most hardcore singers who have a longevity have people 
whose emotions were touched and driven by the lyrical content and by the presence of personality. And that's, again, goes back to the whole justice thing. Justice is that kind of guy. There's probably kids. There's definitely kids who listen to trapped under rice and their life was touched by it. And that again is what makes hardcore great. And maybe it's because we have such a unique cultural value. We can never be a commercial success because in commercial success comes mediocrity comes corniness and I don't feel that that's in any way what hardcore punk has anything to do with. No, nah, you're right. And it's like, uh, I got to give you props on this podcast because we kind of just, we just hit each other up. So let's do it. We didn't even really have a topic. And I know that's not your, your thing. You're, you're more of an organized cat, but yo, you just, you, you know, you know, the game at this point, you, you know what to talk about because you love it. You know what I mean? Like you love talking about this stuff. That's why it comes so easy to you. And when we talk about dudes like Jamie, you know, Jamie want, just wanting to work with that dude, that's the equivalent of Wisdom and Chain saying, yo, we just want to open for Cox Bar. Like, you know, tell us where we go. Uh, try to get us on a show. Help us out. You know, we play for free. What do we got to do? And that's the love. And, and, you know, the roots, his roots are from this scene. So when you get guys like that on and they bring it over that, you know, listen, not everything is about money. Not everything is about you know, X, Y, and Z. Some things are just about a passion. Some things are just about intensity. Some things are just about like desire. Like I have to do this. You know, he wanted to work with that dude by any means necessary, even if it meant out of his own pocket, out of his own time, you know, the only thing getting out of it, the presence of that, that person, you know, that's kind of like the scene, especially when, you know, as, as a band, when we started, happy just happy to share the stage with the agnostic fronts and stuff like that just that's fine with us never mind later to to do a split seven inch with mad ball like that was like wow one of my favorite split seven inches of the last 10 years yeah and we just saw like and and you know how that happened yo freddie want to do a split seven inch yeah man let's do it all right like oh shit and you guys took some flack from the record label who was kind of like wait what the fuck yeah then all of a sudden fred hit me up he's like oh yeah you know i told the record label we're doing this and they kind of have a little beef with it so we just got to square that away but we're doing it no matter what and yeah it was uh their label was kind of like freddie you kind of don't have the right to do this but he's like yeah we want to do it anyway so do what you have to do deal with rich and, and make it happen and that's you know I, who else is going to do that shit? What other scene? You know what I mean? It's just, now nah, it's out of my hands, man. It's the lawyers, man. Nothing I could do, man. You know, no. Nah. Matt Ball said, yeah, make it happen. I'm down to do it. That's how easy it was. And uh, that's why we love this scene. You know, that's why people love it in general. Like a split seven inch with Mad Ball. Like that's, that's crazy. You know, and of course it's not like an insane thing, but it, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, it shouldn't have been that easy. Because that's one of the major players on a big label, but yet it was only because they insisted that it'd be that easy. If they didn't take it into their own hands, if he wasn't hands on, if he wasn't DIY, then he would he would have had to break our heart and say, sorry, guys, the label says this. I wish we could do it, but nothing I could do. Move on, you know, but they don't operate like that. That's why we we appreciate the the personalities in this scene. But, well, that's it's also a testament to the rise of wisdom and chains and the nature of just how you stay within hardcore is this is a thing that is all of ours. This is a movement where people connect and so many levels through the music. And when you encounter someone, be it a fucking 19 year old kid or a fucking 39 year old dude, and they've got that same drive, love, support, passion, you want to get behind it. That's like my biggest driving factor of new bands, bands from guys who I grew up with, who have a new thing going on. It's loving the people whose hearts and heads are where mine is. And there's a synchronicity. And as the culture would say synergy, when mm. you're working with people who have that same kind of vibe. So wisdom and wisdom and manball, that's a combination. In fact, uh, Eddie and um, Hoya talked about it on that show. We had a show in Philadelphia booked at the first Unitarian church for a couple of years back. The fucking day of the show, the wind was 45 to 50 miles an hour. No shit. There was an ice storm. The snow was sideways. The city people couldn't fucking move. The power went out in the first Unitarian church. And 
I sat out front of the church with Sonny Singh and we're like, fuck, we got to find a venue. We got to find a venue. Made a bunch of phone calls. We moved the show. The show had already had like 270 pre-sales. So we were thinking the church with our walk up was going to be pretty fucking packed. And the show was Manball, Leeway, Wisdom and Chains. And I'll tell you what, we had only like 30 people not come who had pre-sale tickets and another 40 show up at a different venue. And it was Manball, Leeway, Wisdom and Chains. And I feel like a complete fucking jerk off for not remembering the opener. I want to say it was a really heavy band, but I totally fucking, oh, was it the Hangman? It was Hangman, I believe, from Long Island and someone else. I can't remember the fucking other band. But my point is, is only in hardcore would the bands like Manball, Leeway, go yeah we'll go to another venue and so it'd be like oh that's it i'm calling my booking agent this is fucking outrageous you owe us all this money and we're not fucking playing <laughs> and that was a dope ass show that was so fun and, and that's the thing is it's like there's a want when you're around the people I imagine if mambo was playing with this like whatever now nah, mambo will probably play to nobody because they they're just that they're like that band like fuck it we showed up there was kids watching we're fucking doing it but like for them, they were like, fuck, we're not missing a show in Philadelphia with Wisdom and Chains. And for you guys, you're like, yo, we're playing with Mambo and fucking Leeway. Like, fuck the, yeah. com- the combination of all of it is what makes the makes it more understandable how Mambo and not only did Mambo and you put out a split 7-inch, but that track Sunday fucking rips. And Thank man, you, man. And I'm standing with Freddie, and Freddie had a couple in him. Let's be real. Freddie had a couple in him. And he goes, oh, shit. It's my song, man. And he's like, and everyone around, like, oh, he had all his boys with him. And they're like, oh, shit. So then came like a puddle of dudes pushing the crowd out of the way so Freddie could get up to you to sing his part. <laughs> but like, yeah, when like, I saw him come he, up, I got excited. But uh, I, I'm telling you the play by play. I'm watching you guys. And I was like, I kind of was like hoping he would get it. So I walked by the bar to like, let's see what happens. And then he's like, oh, what's up? I'm like, yo, man, what's going on? And it was loud as shit. And he's like, he heard the beginning of it. He's like, oh. That's my song, man. And like, <laughs> you can see his face. Fuck this, we're doing this. And he had like, like a, a, a fucking phalanx of dudes pushing people. So like, not gooning them. Just like, hey, get out of the way. We gotta get him to the stage, you know. And he got up there and ripped it. And that's one of the other most fucking awesome things about hardcore in the whole fucking universe is Joe from Wisdom and Stage, Wisdom and Chains is gonna get on stage with Terror and sing that part. Vogel might grab your mic. Like when you have a band playing with a band playing with a band, they're all homies. Shit just gets out of control. We talked about it in the Zach Thorne episode. Bands just jump on each other's shit because they're excited. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, when Guns N' Roses and Metallica toured together, they fucking hated each other. They sat in different dressing rooms, they shit talked, and they were fucking competitive little cunts. And guess what? There's no money that you could offer me to go tour with a band that I don't respect. It's just not happening. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I don't get that shit. Like, not at all. Either of those bands could have had a dope ass tour on their own, picked their own opener, but they go with each other and they hate each other for what? Like, get the fuck out of here. That's ridiculous. And I, I like Guns N' Roses. I like Metallica. I just don't know, like, what the, what the fuck is the point? Now let's let's roll into um, the beginning of a wrap up phase real quick. You have so much going on. One of the things that's a project that we have to talk about, so then we're stuck by our a group of people who listen to us. We are going to do a podcast that airs on the Broad Street Breakdown, Post America podcast, and This Is Hardcore Fest podcast all on the same day. Oh, it's going to shit. feature me, you, and the OG Jeff Gavin. Nice. I'm done. When is that happening? Date's coming soon. We're going to put this out. Um, Broad Street Breakdown to me is Howard Stern, like, styled. They don't say outlandishly rude things about people who are handicapped. But if you're listening to <laughs> rock, if you're listening to wrestling, if you're into a bunch of guys that get together and they talk and they kind of have a whole parameters that they go and they have like little skits, they do this great thing about cameo where they bet on how much the person who does a cameo gets paid to do a cameo. They have like these little intermissions. Pablo does a great job of running the whole thing. They even have a whole skit about poor Pablo and how he can't pronounce it, uh, pronounce it. I say I'd be fucking great for that. I can't say <laughs> and they have Pablo Chipo tip of the week. Yeah, Ch- yeah, Pablo Chipo. Like, if you're into listening to podcasts, you want stuff to listen to. They don't come out regularly, but it's a good three hours of homies talking about shit you're into, and tons of jokes, and not insult inside jokes where you can't laugh. 
I feel like when I put a Broad Street Breakdown podcast on, I'm laughing with my friends, especially, and that goes with Post America podcast, your podcast. Early on, you had me on the show. It was like in the first like 25 episodes. And you, you, I was like the, a returning guest often on the, on the Post America. And for me specifically, I like listening to my friends talk. I like being able to hang out with my dudes when I'm at work. It's like, oh, I didn't miss something. You know, like uh, you've taught us amazing people. Greg, Craig Satari from Youth of Today, Agnostic Front, Sick of It All Now. You've talked to Roger Moret, Freddie Mabel, Hoya, Scott. Like you run through the gamut and you even had a fucking actor from one of my favorite movies, a Bronx Tale. You had Collegiano. Oh, yeah, Lilo. Dude, like you had- You like um, Lilo's jail stories? You hear him? Dude, his, this is what I'm saying. Is, so then when Richie pivoted to the, was I saying earlier in the, in the intro about the quarantine, when Richie pivoted, it used to be him, Joe, Mad Joe, obviously, Chris Mav, who runs the show and kind of like keeps the, the, the sound going good and, and bops in, and whoever comes on as a fourth, it became Richie one-on-one with people. And I'm telling you, man, it, it was another level. It was a different kind of podcast and still within the scene. And I just really enjoyed it. And it, it's something I, I look forward to. Thank you. And then uh, I bullied you into putting on Stitcher. So that way I could uh, download the episodes and listen it, and listen to it on Stitcher because I listen to all my podcasts on Stitch- Stitcher for the most part. Yeah, I said, Chris, why is this not on Stitcher? Next thing I know, Chris said it's on Stitcher. He's good, yeah. that guy. Dude, I, I, I'm up to episode 86 and catching up and stuff. I listened to a bunch, but I know there's ones I missed. So I've been serially going through and listening to two a week to catch up as I'm listening to the new ones as they come out. Nice, nice. Yeah, so, I, w- I wish I could do them a little more consistent, but it's not bad. Little gaps no. here and there. So um, obviously you had Eric from the the wide world of wrestling, who was also a Cleveland hardcore dude who worked at Peabody. And then he's also into my world with the medievalism. And he's a like true Viking. He's got a great YouTube channel. But who are people you have coming up on your show? Um, Dealing with... Uh... Coming up will be Aaron, like I said, death threat. Pizza uh, Aaron. Jimmy uh, from Murphy's Law, which I think will be good because Jimmy, uh, you know, he's a popular, well-known figure, but he kind of doesn't do this stuff too often. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what I could get him to talk about. I really want to kind of dig in into into the earliest days of Murphy's Law, you know, because that's Damn. such an important kind of band. Was and and sometimes overlooked. You know, I'm going to want to talk. I'm really excited to talk to Jimmy, but that that's, that's two that are coming up. And then yeah, I'll probably do stuff with, uh, I, when I just did an episode with Chris came back, uh, and, uh, we just went over questions cause I had so many that built came up out, uh, that came out yesterday. Right. Yeah. And it was kind of like, we, we used to do that when it was the three of us did the podcast together and then we stopped and I did those, you know, single interviews for so long and all the questions kept building up. So I still have a lot more. So either I'll get uh I'll get Chris back on or Joe whenever they're available again. Try to finish off these questions. Hate to leave anybody hanging. So that even that's episode. something I could I could do with you. It's just, it's just a random broad questions. It's uh, relationships, this that. You know. So yeah, I could do stuff like that. But otherwise, same old stuff. You know. I, I'm glad that that you're liking it. And we're getting really good feedback. 125 episodes in. What do you think is the biggest thing you learned becoming a podcast in the hardcore space? I don't know. Uh, biggest thing I learned, I, like, there was a point where, where we were going to shows and people started coming up to me about the podcast before the band. You know, I was like, oh, wow, people are actually listening to this. Early on, 2015, 2016, I was like, oh, just my friends are, are listening, you know. And then I started seeing, okay, there's people that don't like Wisdom and Chains that are listening now. And that's that's kind of weird. You know what I mean? And uh, but that's good, you know, and then there's people that listen to us because they don't like us personally. And I get a lot of those messages because of what, whatever we may say or or political. So we like to talk about politics just in general. So we brought that over to the podcast. So I kind of I kind of saw a gauge of the hardcore community and, uh, and and politically how they feel. And it's it's pretty it's pretty cool, man. I, I learned that. People say, "Oh, you can't say this. You can't say that in the pod, in the hardcore scene. You'll get you'll get banned." This and I said whatever I want. And so far, I definitely had a lot of complaints, 
but you can't ban somebody that's not willing to leave. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of learned that ah, I'm not even this whole PC nonsense of people. I think people over exaggerate how how bad it is because yeah, there are complainers, but they're few and far between and they're really powerless unless you allow them to control what you're saying. You know what I mean? So I kind of, I made me, it made me appreciate the scene more and, and it put me back in, in the mix of thinking like, Oh, more people think like I, th- I thought then, then, you know, it didn't change as much as I thought it did. There's still plenty of, of people that have stuff in common with, you know, and that could take a joke and blah, blah, blah. But it's fun, man. I, and now I'm seeing, cause I used to only listen to Joe Rogan. That was it. Joe Rogan. And if somebody else was on a podcast that I wanted to hear from, I'd find it and listen to one episode and that was it. But now there's like dudes in the scene and I'm listening to their stuff. And I, it's like, this is what I've been waiting for, you know, but back when we first started, there weren't many hardcore options, you know, but now it's kind of like I got everybody in my library, people I know personally, and I'm listening to their stuff and everybody seems that they're all the podcasts are doing great and they're all good. And, you know, that's, that's, that's important to me, man. You actually touched on the next stage because you had been doing it for a good five years now. Where do you see the hardcore podcast space going? And if you were directing someone who says, I want to start a podcast, but everyone's talked to everybody important. What would you say to that? Well, it's kind of similar to what you said, like, you know, you named three po- podcasts that had a person like Scott Vogel on, but yet, you know, they didn't cover the same topics. They didn't go the same route. So whoever the podcaster is, what's their goal? What are they good at? What are they interested in? Like if they're doing something that it's already being done then yeah, don't fucking bother. You know, if they don't know how to hold a conversation that's interesting, then yeah, don't bother. But it doesn't matter if the people that are taken up that you want to talk to, if you have a different angle, like you just mentioned me, I wanted to hear I want to hear the beef, you know, between Paris and Harley. But then you you were talking and you made me think like, yeah, let me hear what made Paris get into this shit in the first place. What makes him. And I didn't have that perspective until 15 minutes ago when you mentioned it. So there's, you know, we we could take the same guest and a lot of different paths. You know, we don't have to talk about the same the same uh topics just because it's the same person so but so if people want to get into this first off know how to have a conversation at least be interesting the only reason we started doing this is because this was the same three guys plus more in vans for seven eight nine ten hour trips and we were talking and talking and talking and then when we weren't talking it was because we were listening to a podcast and we said, let's give it a shot and see if people are interested in hearing the bullshit that we like to do and random babblings. And it, it kind of worked out. It's not the biggest podcast in the world, but we do good. And I'm very often surprised the feedback we get from the places we get it overseas, all over the world, different states. And from a lot of people at this point that aren't even really interested in wisdom and chains. You know, some people got turned on to wisdom and chains through the podcast, which is uh a weird thing but we don't focus it around our band but early on i just imagined that if we did have any listeners they'd be from you know from the band you know what i mean uh one of the things that i find most interesting about episodes is that you did something where obviously you're connected to people within hardcore like stick man and stuff but you also had people like ray and ray ray is like a pa hardcore staple and obviously someone who i spent hours in a fucking van with as a kid. Yeah. You created a scenario where a Ray Ray becomes like a facet where people from France and England know who Ray Ray is. And I find that to be one of the coolest aspects. Do you find that people that listen that are nowhere near Pennsylvania, maybe even in Europe know about people like Ray Ray? Yes. Yes. We will go into a place and it happened many times and people say, yo, where's Ray or tell Ray we said, what's up. And at first I was like, how does Ray know this motherfucker from, from out here? You know, huh? I was like, yeah, yeah. All right. I'll tell him. And then I was like, Oh, it's because of the podcast. Like these guys feel like they know Ray because of the podcast. But the reason we put Ray on the podcast is because we knew this dude is crazy. He's got a crazy personality. People like listening to him. He's interesting in a, in a, in a weird way. And, but early on, yeah, people were saying it all over. I heard it in uh, the first time I remember it was Switzerland. And then people are like, hey, how's Ray? I'm like, 
huh? Ray. I'm like, oh, and I knew who they were talking about, right? Because I'm like, yeah, good, good. Tell him I said, what's up? I'm like, all right. And then uh, I was talking to Chris Mavramatis upstairs. I'm like, yo, some dude around here knows Ray. He's like, Ray from PA? I'm like, yeah. He's like, huh? And he's like, from the podcast? And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, that's how they, and I remember being in Detroit, people asking about Ray, Germany, people asking about Ray all over the place. But just like you know him well, if you would explain something to Ray, you're probably like, yo, they would love this dude, Ray. I wish they could meet Ray. And that's kind of how we felt. That's why we used to have him on. And sure enough, yeah, he took off. We got to get him back on. He's all wifed up now, though. He's all busy all the time. Happy as shit. Jeez. We we want old, miserable, drunken Ray. We don't want this new happy Ray. My final thing to ask you is that do you feel as if there's ever going to be a moment where we could do some form of like a live podcast? Because I know that something that has been pivoting in the venue spaces is people being to me like, hey, man, uh, you know, we do we do have the ability to seat to like 35 or 40 if you want to do a live podcast. And with live streaming being something that is around. Do you see any value in doing something at a live format as post-America podcast, or do you even see people coming? You know what? I think some people might show up. I think it could be good, but I don't know. Uh, as for live listeners, I don't know how many people would sign on live no, when they know that they could check it out later. You know what I'm saying? No, I mean but, like straight up in the venue. Yeah, I think I think people would actually show up, show up to sit there and sit through it live. Not insane amounts, but... I think we'd get some people to sit there, but if they were streaming live, I don't know how many people would, would punch in, but, uh, yeah, I think people would come out live, especially if it was more focused the way I kind of do stuff now, just winging shit, you know, uh, I don't know how that would go over, but if it was like, you know, a guy like you organizing it and it would be this topic is being discussed. Yeah. I think a crowd would show up, uh, to check it out. I think we're going to be working on a live post America podcast event in 2021 and I'll curate it for you guys. Damn. Let's do it. Yo, check it out um, and get some, uh, you, you know what? It'd be dope. We get a little venue and uh, if shows aren't going on yet, maybe like, you know, depending on what the venue allows bands set up to sell merch and chill and some food and a fucking podcast. So it has the 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 it had would have the vibe of like the side room of a show, you know what I mean? I'm into that. I like the idea of that a lot, and I think that'd be kind of fun. No doubt, yo. And listen, listen. Good talking to you. And then shout you out get... any of the fast break releases that are coming out, or anything that you're doing, like Z9, and uh, give me a give the listeners a purview of the things that you have been working on, so they can check it out. Well, me, Joe, and our friend Keith have crucified Straight Edge merch, which is uh, the preferred merch around the planet since all the other Straight Edge merch companies are falling off or doing bad things or being, uh, you know, selling out. Crucified remains on the top of the, the, the heap. So look for that shit online. Crucified Straight Edge merch. And uh, that's me, Joe, and Keith. Then we got Fast Break Records, of course. And... Uh, a new release is coming up will be the band you mentioned z9 which is members of wisdom and chains wisdom and chains was building up so many uh songs and they weren't kind of going anywhere because people were busy this and that so i was just like you know what i'm gonna just go in a different direction because i love to record and uh i just started writing a bunch of songs i did uh demoed a lot of stuff on my own but to actually record i had to get the pros in there so i had to get luke and evan on because nobody plays like Luke and Evan and uh, they'll kill the bass and the drums the way they should be because that's, you know, I mean, I could play that stuff, but not like they could play. So we're going to have a new release. We're starting to record early February. But if you go on social media, you can find Z9 apostrophe, uh, follow those things on Instagram or Facebook. And there's some samples and you can kind of hear the, the range of the stuff more like a rock and roll street rock vibe. Stuff that I listen to a lot, I call driving music. I love like the, that sort of music on road trips and stuff. Uh, and uh, what else we got going on with the podcast, of course? And uh, what's up with MH Chaos? When's that come out? Well, we had a discussion with them. Uh -huh. And I feel, and this is how I am with the release. That I was like, look, man, whatever you put out, when the world opens up, you're going to be playing for a while. 
make sure this is home run material. Don't give us your C tracks, your B tracks. And so I got some checking out tracks on a Dropbox, and it's out of this fucking world. Dope. And my biggest thing is if we're gonna if we're if we you and I and Fast Break put our asses behind something that is anything less than what they're totally totally psyched on, like there's this young and this is like a, I don't want to go too far away from what we're talking about here often young bands are forced to just put out a release so they can stay relevant Mm -hmm. i told you don't want to do that i told them look you haven't played a show since the last show in january at fya or no you know what i think they might have played ldb after ldb fest the end of february they haven't played i'm like so you have to treat the band like you like it's it's the day after LB LDB and, and everything we still have to do, we have to do. Yes. Take a, you know, they had an amazing track on the one scene unity comp and it's so fucking metallic and out of control. It's literally nuts. And I said, look, if you're going to take all your songs, this direction, you may, you may actually end up losing some kids that thought you were guys are going to be like the ultimate beat down hard shit. And the direction they're taking the tunes are fucking fantastic. And I, I just, as a friend over the last year, and how crazy it's been a year since you and I sat down and talked about putting their release out. We all went to dinner to talk about it. It's been yep. a year since we've been talking about putting it out. And they are working on the tracks to make the release something that they can run with, that I can get them on shows and we can get them really working to be more than just a band people know from FYA and LDB and a Chicago band. And so instead of rushing them, they have tracked some stuff and they're finding the details out and then it's going to be fantastic when it comes out, but we're not rushing it. So it's coming out, but we don't have a definite date, but that's another fast break release. We're looking forward yeah, to. That, that's it's, it's 1000% coming out. And I think it's because I've told them to err on the side of making sure everything that you're writing is stuff you're willing to play because who the fuck wants to write six songs and two, a year and a half later, somebody's like, Hey, we need another eight songs now, like write some shit that you guys would be happy playing out. So people will check this vibe out, you know. And now's the time to write while you have time. You don't got, you know, there's no shows, nothing's booked. Right. Everybody should be doing that. Now's the time to to be building up your catalog. But don't just do it to do it. If you gotta wanna do it, you gotta write good songs. Don't put out any crap. Well, I feel like for them, they're so they're like a fucking if if you told them, Hey, I need a record that sounds like this, tomorrow they'd have 10 songs. They're all actually overly capable of just writing whatever possible because they're talented yeah and that's like the thing so yeah we'll be getting this out i want i'm hoping for early early earliest i would say would be june would be and they're from chicago correct chicago could we lead this uh this uh podcast or end it with one of one of their tracks well we absolutely will nice i was i was hoping to open it with a z9 if z9 is ready but if not i'll open it with an mh Open it with an MH. Yeah, I just got demo uh, quality stuff at the time, but okay. Well, listen. When it's ready, you'll know. I appreciate you being the first person to do a double take to come back on. Episode. They call that a DT in the podcast industry. I just did DT. And um, get ready for the triple threat of a. I don't know if there's ever been a podcast where it releases on three streams. Never, ever, ever done. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that you're going to see when you see podcasts like the three of ours all working together. Yeah, man. I can't wait to talk to the OG. And I can't wait for you to get Bob Wilson on your show and grill him. Bobby. <laughs> all right, brother. I'll talk to you, man. All right, homie. Take it easy. Take it easy. I hope you enjoyed that one. Richie and I talk a lot, and it was very good to kind of capture a lot of what we speak when we're on the telephone in a podcast format for you to enjoy. For those of you who didn't check out Episode 7, I hope this gives you the inertia and excitement to do so. Next week's guest, Louis Aponte, Lou2K. This is Louis from Jesus Peace, who is an amazing drummer, PA hardcore dude. More importantly, just a solid individual with a lot of interesting side hustles and other projects he's been working on. This is the beginning of a two-part series where I do Lewis one week, and then next week I do another one of his band members. So check it out. Thank you for listening. Hit us up if you liked it. Subscribe. Do all the other podcast gimmicks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.